Hey, everyone. I'm Nicholas Rinaldi, General Manager at Canary Media, and I'm delighted to welcome you to Canary Live New York. This is our first in-person live event we've ever done. And to do it in New York, <laughs> you can't miss Pat in the room. Um, to do it in New York at this beautiful green space with our partners and friends at Postscript Media and Climavores is out of this world amazing. It's more than we ever dreamed of. Um, so just to give you a little background for those, and we're live streaming this um, right now, so there's a lot of folks in the room not watching. So I think everybody here probably knows Canary Media, but if you're watching, you don't know, we are a nonprofit um, newsroom focused on the energy transition and covering solutions to the climate crisis. We launched in April 2021, so we're only about 18 months old. Um, but, and we launched with the generous support of RMI, which of course is one of the leading clean energy think tanks globally. Um, and since we launched, we've really strived to publish journalism that is engaging, uh, influential, and educates everyone from the White House and US Congress to local homeowners here in New York and beyond. Um, so if you're not subscribed to our newsletter, that's the easiest way to support us. Go to canarymedia.com and subscribe today. So tonight, we have two amazing panels. The first is going to be our local act, if you will, focused on the top three trends in energy and climate here in New York. It features Marie French from Politico New York, Sam Maldonado from the city, and then Canary Media's own Julian Spector and Maria Gallucci. That's the first panel. Then we have another networking break so you all can drink again and mingle. You look like you were having a lot of fun. Um, and that will be followed by a live recording of the Climavores podcast with Tamar Haspel and Mike Grunwald, two nationally renowned journalists. You have like some of the some world class journalists here tonight, right? Let's give it up for them. <laughs> so before we start, I just want to say thank you to our sponsors. We have an incredible group of sponsors here. Without them, this would not have happened. Or if it did, it'd probably be a lot less pleasurable. So. <laughs> I want to thank Rise Light and Power, um, our signature sponsor. Their CEO, Clint Plummer, is going to be coming up momentarily um, to introduce the first panel. I also want to thank our premier sponsor, Sealed. We have some folks from Sealed in the house tonight. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, and some old friends of Canary Media, even though we're only 18, month, 18 months old, Fish Tank PR. Um, Eric Fishgren's in the house tonight. Thank you for your continued support. And the beer that you all were drinking tonight was from New Belgium Brewery. They made a very generous donation, so let's, let's thank them. <laughs> all right, so without further ado, um, I'm proud to announce Clint Plummer. Please, uh, please join us up here, Clint. Hey, thanks, Nick. I appreciate that. As Nick mentioned, my name is Clint Plummer. I'm the CEO of Rise Light and Power. Uh, I'm delighted to be here tonight at Canary Media's inaugural live action event and I want to just take a minute to explain why we're so proud to explain this. Right now the world is in the midst of a unprecedented transition in the way that we make and use energy and it's not just about how we move our cars or where the power in our electronics comes from. This transition touches every aspect of our lives. Of course, climate change is a critical part of that. It's real, and there are things that we need to be doing now to affect that. But it's broader than that. This affects jobs, as we've seen in the Ukraine. This affects national security. It also has a massive impact on affordability, as we've seen with inflation and the cost of groceries going up in many ways driven simply by energy. So it's incumbent that we recognize how important this energy transition is and that it's very challenging but simultaneously necessary. Nowhere in the world is it more difficult to affect the transition from fossil fuels to renewables than in densely populated urban areas like New York City. And I know this because our company owns and operates the largest fossil fire generating facility in New York City. The Ravenswood Generating Station makes about 20% of all the generating capacity in New York City. We're a critical part of keeping the lights on, but most of our facility was built in the 1960s. It's 
very well-maintained technology, but anywhere else in the country where there was more real estate, more available space to build new infrastructure, this type of facility would have been retired and replaced with something newer and more efficient. The very things that make places like New York so special, the density, the ability to get together like this, the ability to get a great burrito at three o'clock in the morning, those things are all driven by density and that density makes it very difficult to change big substantive structural things like energy infrastructure. But it's also critical that we do this. And I know that as well because before I came to this job, I spent 13 years in the offshore wind business, proudly part of the team that developed and built America's first offshore wind farm. And the reason I came here and the reason that we're so proud to sponsor organizations like Canary is that infrastructure like that which we own and operate now is vital to this transition. In the time that I've been with RISE, we've announced massive plans to transform our site to what we call Renewable Ravenswood, a clean energy hub that will lead to, by the end of this decade, us retiring and replacing all of our 1960s vintage fossil generation with new renewable energy brought down from upstate New York, brought in from offshore wind, stored on site with battery energy storage. And the very best part of this is we can do this not only in a way that is cost effective with replacing this older capacity, but also in a way that creates a just transition for the workforce. Our site has for decades proudly employed hundreds of men and women from the utility workers local 1-2. And with the plans that we're bringing forward now, we'll continue to employ people just working not on fossil, but on clean energy infrastructure. Union, I should add. So with all of that, I just want to say how delighted I am to be here, not just for this opportunity, uh, but also to see how many people have turned out, how many people care about this. The decisions that we make now on how we spend our money and who we vote into office are going to have lasting consequences for ourselves and our children. And as a father of three, I'd ask you to keep in mind those decisions and to make smart choices for yourself, the people you elect, and the places that you get your news media, because that matters for us to be able to transition our economy from fossil to clean energy. With that, I want to say thank you again very much, and I want to welcome Julian Spector, who's going to lead an amazing panel with a number of my great friends. Julian? Hey, there's a, there's a full crowd in here. How are y'all doing tonight? Hello, New York City. Uh, there's, a, there's a Yankees game on and you're here with us. That, that says a lot. Um, but I think uh, we're gonna try to make this panel kind of clean energy version of Aaron Judge. It's all homers all night, but no drugs, no drugs. So, um, so I'm Julian Spector. I'm a senior reporter at Canary Media. I get to roam around the world and seek out, you know, compelling stories at the front lines of the transition to clean energy. Um, that means I've been living in much sunnier, warmer environments than New York City. Uh, and uh, since arriving here a few weeks ago, I've been called things like nice and earnest and <laughs> told I should really try to find at least one thing I can complain about uh, convincingly. So we couldn't just leave me up here alone. We needed to find some actual New Yorkers who uh, have, you know, some opinions to share, some facts and, and some, uh, you know, hard truths. Because we are here tonight to evaluate New York's progress towards its very ambitious climate goals. Um, we have some great people to, to break that down for us, though. So uh, starting here right on my right, Marie French from Politico. She's uh, over in Albany covering the ins and outs of the, the you know, center of power for the state. Um, want to do some applause for that? She's got, you probably read her work. Probably read her work. I'd just like to point out I don't identify as a New Yorker. I'm not a native New Yorker, but I am an upstate New Yorker. Upstate New Yorker. <laughs> that counts. That counts. Um, yeah. So then we have Samantha Maldonado with the city, uh, covering all sorts of aspects of how climate impacts New York City and uh, you know how the the um, government here is working on decarbonizing all facets of of society. Let's hear it for Sam. <laughs> 
And then my colleague Maria Gallucci, who is also based in the city here and has done some great work on the, the arrival of the wind power coming and the, the changes to the economy here as a result of the clean energy. It's, it's uh, great to be in person with you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so, so we don't want to do too much preamble. We want to get into, you know, the really like breaking down the, the major areas of action on uh, New York's climate goals. Um, felt like I should just set up a, a couple of the like high level trends here. So this state um, is moving towards 100% carbon free energy. Um, the deadline for that is 2040. And uh, that also needs to be 70% renewable at that time. Um, now, if you look at the way the energy system works right now, statewide, it's, it's pretty good. It's like 50% zero emission. Uh, a lot of that's actually hydro and, and the nuclear that you all have allowed to continue running. Um, but if you break down the, the state into like upstate versus downstate, the New York area, uh, the New York City area, I should say, it, it's pretty filthy. And it's not just the, the piles of garbage on the sidewalks and the rats and all those fun things I've been getting to see. Um, it's that there's very little clean energy anywhere near this metropolis uh, where many, many millions of people live. Um, so, you know, there's a few high level uh, challenges there. One is you need more clean energy total, but you also need to find ways to get it into this enormous city with lots of people uh, and to try to do that without breaking the bank. So that is, that is not easy. Uh, and to the extent that we're going to be trying to find places where progress hasn't kept up with the ambitions, you know, that's not to be mean, that's just to say like, where, where, where do we need to try even harder? What needs to, what needs to be changed in the, in the course of action? And then what is actually, you know, on track and, and looking good. Um, so let's start with the renewable energy build out. That's kind of the, the crux of the, the strategy here, build clean energy, electrify everything else. Um, so let's start with offshore wind. Uh, states, you know, doesn't have much of it right now. In fact, there's, there's Approximately none, right? Um, but does anyone want to kick us off with uh, your, your, your view on, you know, is the state on track uh, with its offshore wind ambitions? Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so just to uh, throw out some stats, so New York has a goal of building nine gigawatts of offshore wind power by 2035, I believe, and that would uh, supply about 30% of the state's total electricity needs. Right now, there's 4.3 gigawatts worth of projects in the pipeline. And if everything goes as uh, the developers say it will, the first project, South Fork Wind, might be have turbines spinning in the water by the end of next year. Um, right now, they are just starting kind of the early construction phases on the land side of things. So um, yeah, I guess, I guess the next couple years will tell us, be a good indication of how quickly things are going to keep on track. There's a lot of prep and a lot of <laughs> promises in terms of jobs and what communities will get out of these turbines that will come and all of the ancillary things that come with them, whether they're substations or uh, transmission lines and everything, manufacturing that goes with that. But yeah, as Maria says, it's really a matter of how many years <laughs> will it take and what kind of delays will we see moving forward. Yeah, and I think it's important to note that these projects, you know, when they were first announced, the, the first two that have state contracts, when they were announced in 2019 by Governor Andrew Cuomo, you know, they were supposed to be online, I think, uh, 2024, May 2024 and end of 2024 for the two projects. And of course, those dates are now 2025 and 2026 um, for them to, to actually be generating. And I don't think uh, we should ignore the fact that to actually achieve the state's, you know, ultimate 2030 and 2040 goals, we're gonna need a whole lot more offshore wind than just nine gigawatts. We're gonna need much more than that. I think the Climate Action Council, you know, supporting analysis calls for about, I wanna say double what the state goal is by that year. So it's, you know, a massive amount that needs to be built out even beyond what the state's planning to contract for right now. Okay, wow, a lot, of, a lot going on there. So it's, even though there's nothing on, no, no points on the board just yet, there's a lot of the preparatory work in, in progress, but even the, even the goal that is being pushed might not, might not be enough to, to meet the long-term goal of cleaning up the grid. So let, let's move to solar. Um, in California, where I've been living, that's obviously the leading new source of uh, clean energy, but uh, it's a little different out here. It's a little grayer. Um, maybe, you know, not, not so much of the sunshine out here. So wh wh what do we need to know about the solar sector of New York State? 
we're gonna we're gonna need a lot of it, uh, <laughs> like crazy amounts. Um, and we're still seeing, a, I think, a lot of difficulty with permitting. Um, Ores, the Office of Renewable Energy Siting, which is the new state office that was set up to to do permitting and speed it up, essentially, for renewable developers, is still staffing up, uh, and it's been two years. So you know, we're it's, it's hard we're to find waiting. good people these mm -hmm. days. You Pandemic know, Pandemic years so. too. <laughs> it's uh, it's been tough. It's been tough for sure. I think when we think about solar, we think about the solar panels on homes or community solar where people can sort of plug into a project and get the benefits um, themselves and then utility scale solar. And uh, you know they're both important in different ways, especially in terms of individuals engaging with like clean energy, um, but we're just not there on either account. And in New York City in particular, it's really hard to site solar no matter what. Um, there's some old fire codes that make it really hard to put on roofs and things like that. And we just don't have the space to do utility scale solar um, and so you know there's well, I'm sure we'll talk about this more but there's transmission lines in the works that would in part bring solar down uh, to the city to help clean up the grid but we're not there yet <laughs> it's kind of the theme of this night I think yeah yeah just to throw out another stat um, so that New York City has a goal of installing one gigawatt with a solar by 2030 and I believe has about a third is about a third of the way there so 300 megawatts and uh, the sense is that um, it's possible to to meet that goal, but they, the city would really have to accelerate what's happening. And, and as Sam just mentioned, there's a lot of challenges to doing that. Um, one project, I, I recently visited the Javits Center, which if, um, I suppose you probably know if you're, if you're in New York, but if not, it's this massive convention center um, not too far from here. And it was interesting to learn about how they figured out how to put solar panels on the roof because there were all of these uh, HVAC units kind of sprinkled around where they wanted to build and so they had and a, a lot of um, grasses that they had put to absorb storm water runoff so mm -hmm. it was kind of the green roof conflicting a bit with the solar panel the, the, the solar powered roof so they did find a way to build around that but I think that it was a good example of the sort of unique complications that New York City faces and I mean this project also is in the shadow of all of these skyscrapers that are built being built um, on the west side so and that's an eternal kind of factor for New York City yeah it's colder here because you guys don't have as much sun because it's blocked <laughs> yeah. by the buildings <laughs> if you stand in the right angle <laughs> that's why you try so hard to get it up on the roof and then someone builds a new billionaire uh, residence that's just blocking all your sun you can't do anything about that so yeah I, I think the solar it's 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 tough out here I think New York City is a good uh, counter example to the the sort of vision of the clean energy future that's all small scale and er every home just puts it on the roof because you know you have too many people living in very tall buildings that don't have the roof space relative to the, the actual occupants here so um, that points to the need to build more elsewhere in the state and, and pipe it in somehow um, I did want to shout out you know New York is I mean there, there is a big distributed you know small scale solar uh, across the state in the sense that there's actually very little large-scale solar getting built. So to the extent that, you know, I think they just crashed four, four gigawatts installed of distributed and, you know, th th there's a lot on roofs, there's a lot of community solar, people in the community solar industry talk about New York as the leading example of, you know, policies in intended to help people subscribe to solar without needing it on their own roof or, or even owning a roof. Um, you know, so that's that's a, a, a part of it here, but uh, it, it's certainly not showing up as big as it is in, in other states like in the in the West or I mean, I think uh, according to the Solar Energy Industry Association, I didn't see New York on the top 10 list of installed like New Jersey was on there, Massachusetts, but not not New York as of the last quarter. So, um, OK, moving on to one that's uh, near and dear to my heart, energy storage big batteries, uh, basically. Um, that's generally considered crucial to taking the, the ups and downs of wind and solar production and making it available at the times you actually need it. Um, you know, what's going on with batteries? Anyone, anyone been able to go see the opening of a, a very large battery in New York anywhere? Certainly not in New York City. Uh, no. Not large, certainly not. Um, I think obviously, you know, I, th I think a lot of folks are familiar with the Con Ed RFP where they didn't award any large battery project, um, which was somewhat upsetting uh, for some people, I'm sure. 
Uh, maybe, maybe we should explain that for the people who aren't familiar, but you know, so oh, kind of. Oh, okay. Utility, I just assumed you, you were know? all energy nerds. I thought. Oh, they are. They are. Here. Let's not impugn <laughs> our audience here. Oh, sorry. <laughs> really good at this, guys. Um, <laughs> But uh, Con Ed uh, was required by the Public Service Commission to issue a, a utility scale request for proposals for um, battery storage. I believe 300 megawatts was the, the target. I mean, other, other utilities were also required to issue RFPs, but they were like you know, 10, 20 megawatts. They didn't have to go as big as Con Ed because we're going to need a lot more storage in New York City uh, than we are probably in other parts of the state to, to meet the, the ultimate goals here. And they didn't award any, uh, and that was sad. But they're going to issue a new one in, in fall 2022. So later, presumably in the next few months. I haven't seen it come out yet. Yeah. So and I, I did a little digging because I, I like writing about batteries. Um, but yeah, there there was this one awarded to a company called 174 Power Global. Um, I think it originally talked about being coming on this year. Now it's maybe next year. That'll be 100 megawatts in uh, Astoria. So. You know, that is a sizable battery, um, but yeah, there's just been much smaller development so far. And, and there's certainly state policies uh, giving grants and, and funding to get battery storage built, but there isn't what you would call a, a thriving market for it. Uh, and I think people are still figuring out the business model that makes sense. It's hard to get financing for a, a battery project if you can't look at anyone in, the, in this state and say that they've made a profit by investing in this kind of asset um so that's a that's a challenge um and yeah so there is a storage target uh on the books but the initial 2022 deadline got pushed back to 2025 because no one was gonna make it in time so i would say that one's maybe maybe not on track yet but it could it could turn around um at some point also fire code is really hard in new york city it's yeah. uh we face it, a lot of the same challenges with solar that we do for battery storage installation here because of fire code situations which um you know in some in some ways it's smart you hear about you know the batteries for e-bikes blowing up <laughs> in different housing which is sad um and we don't want that to happen but there has to be a way to sort of be able to permit this these batteries because we need them um, and I know the mayor, Eric Adams, has sort of proposed this zoning text resolution to change the way that we're allowed to build different developments in different places. Um, and there's one called, I think it's called Zoning for Zero Carbon. And he says it would make it easier for us to be able to install battery storage and sort of like larger, larger scale, city sized scale renewables places. Um, but we have not seen any of that text yet. So still waiting. We'll see how it goes once we see it maybe later next year is what I've heard. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so, oh yeah. Oh, I was just going to add, you know, on, on the battery issue. I think a lot of uh, the industry and me, because I love to write about roadmaps, is waiting for the energy storage roadmap 2.0. 2.0. <laughs> what, what happened uh, to 1.0? Uh, we're done with that. We already. Oh, okay. We, it's, we, it's, it's, it's totally it's, over. We're we. Past, past that. I think they basically got like the subsidies, like under that, have already been, you know, subscribe oversubscribed and okay. not uh, totally subscribed. So. Energy Storage Roadmap 2.0 could, could give us a better idea of what kind of state subsidies and contracts will be available for the storage industry. So they'll actually, you know, none of these developers or, or the incumbent generators that I talk to who are, you know, thinking about storage plan to build it without a long-term contract or, or support of some kind. There's no, no ability to do that in the current energy mar markets. And, and do we know when that roadmap comes? I, I can't say. <laughs> all right. All right. Um, well, yeah, then I, I, I mean, just to kind of cap off this whole clean energy build out section, um, wanted to talk about just reliability and this idea of, how, you know, we're shifting from fossil powered plants that we can control and call up when we need them. Um, the offshore wind is coming. There's maybe more solar coming. Maybe the batteries will arrive. But how, how do you is see the state tying all these different pieces together into a fundamentally new way of running the grid that has to keep all the lights on in New York City, has to keep the subway running, the elevators going up and down, um, you know, without without burning fossil fuels like we do today. Uh, like, the, you know, have you seen a, a com compelling policy work that all these different threads are going to be tied together in a, in a way that works? Are you asking who's in charge? Uh, that could be that could be part of it. Yeah. 
Yeah, well, I mean, the Public Service Commission and uh, NISO, our grid operator, I, and Marie can correct me if I'm wrong, which is true for literally everything I'm about to say in this whole panel, but, um, <laughs> you know, they're, they're supposed to make sure that, you know, our power can stay on, that we have enough, uh, you know, resources that are dispatchable to use when we need them to make sure that we're not overtaxing our grid and to make sure it is, you know, dependable and, and hardy uh, <laughs> for times of, like, climate change and also just in terms of, yeah, having demand be met by what's there, what's available? Yeah, I think you'll, you've kind of asked the question that I feel like the state has avoided answering uh, fairly successfully so far. Uh, what is the dispatchable emissions-free resource that we need, you know, hundreds if not thousands of, of megawatts and uh, gigawatts of? Um, and we don't really know the answer yet, but I will remind everyone that the climate law has off-ramps. The Public Service Commission, if it con is concerned about reliability, can, you know, be like, well, I guess we're not going to hit zero emissions by 2040. Will they want to do that? No, I don't think they will. Are they trying, you know, I mean, policymakers are trying very hard to hit these targets, but there are some questions that they haven't answered yet. And part of that is because, you know, we want to see what technologies emerge, but part of it is because these are politically difficult questions to answer. Yeah, off ramps, that could be important. Um, I was just in Hawaii where they, they shut down the last coal plant, and that was dictated by a law specifically to end the use of coal. Uh, and there wasn't sort of a, an asterisk around and make sure all the solar plants have been built before you do that. So it got a little a little dicey. It ended up being okay. No, no one lost power, um, but they're, they're burning a bit more oil in the meantime, and prices are going up because all the new reinforcements weren't weren't there. So... Yeah, a little flexibility as opposed to dictating hard terms absent, you know, knowing the reality on the ground is uh, it's good to, to have that. Um, well, let's uh, keep moving to the next section, which is buildings. Um, buildings as a sector is uh, now the biggest source of carbon emissions in the, in the state. Uh, so you got to do something about that. And as anyone who lives in the city knows, there's a lot of old buildings here. Uh, they are not the most energy efficient. Is fuel oil in the basement keeping the keeping the heat going through the winter? It's a it's kind of a it's kind of a gnarly problem, I think. So um, let's start with uh, you know one of the hot policy ideas in the in the building decarbonization world, which is banning gas, uh, you know, fossil gas or natural gas in new building construction, um, and that kind of forces developers to electrify the appliances and, and you know, heat and, and do, you know, your water and cooking without fossil fuels. Um, and New York City is actually taking some action on this. So um, maybe Sam, is that is that something yeah. you want to take? Well, New York City did it. <laughs> they, okay. they put a, uh, yeah, a ban on gas and new construction. I believe it starts in, oh, now I'm for any year, but I, 2026? I think it's on the paper, so you should check. But um, <laughs> <laughs> I believe it's that, and it depends on uh, how how many stories your building is. The you know smaller, the, the fewer the stories, the sooner it is, and the taller the building, the later it is. Um, but essentially, yeah, it has to be electric, can't have any gas or fossil fuels burning. Um, and we've definitely seen some of these buildings already that are being built or have been built, um, both affordable housing, for example, and market rate units that have, you know, heat pumps and electric or induction stoves. Um, and, you know, you hear different tales about how much it costs to build, how are the residents enjoying it or not enjoying it. Um, but what I am always told by you know, different developers is it's not only about electrifying, it's about keeping these buildings really uh, efficient and having like a very strong building envelope um, so it doesn't take as much energy uh, to, to heat them or cool them, which ultimately can fall to the tenants in them. Um, but anyway, that is one thing that is happening and uh, it's, it's leading the state, I would say. Um, Ithaca also has uh, a goal for, uh, I believe, all electric buildings, all electric everything maybe by a certain date in the mid 2020s, um, if not a little bit later. Uh, but otherwise the state hasn't done it yet. They have punted. There was a bill in the session this last time and they did not pass it. Um, even though the Climate Action Council, which is the body that's tasked with you know, figuring out how to meet our climate goals, um, they did recommend to have uh, all electric buildings mandated. Gotcha, well that sounds like an Albany drama there. So Marie, uh, so can you fill us in on what, um, what, what happened? Why, why didn't the idea that flies in New York City uh, work in the, in the state capitol? 
because uh, uh, the state capitol also has people from upstate and Long Island. Oh, yes. that's yeah. and they are they're, they're New Yorkers too, or are they still? I, we, I believe they still consider it? themselves New Yorkers. Oh, okay, yes. cool, cool. Yes, gotcha. they do. Um, but yeah, I mean, it was a it was definitely a huge push uh, this past session to try to get you know some type of all electric buildings. I think their best shot was, of course, in the budget, uh, where many more things can get done politically. Uh, and that didn't happen. Uh, Senate Democrats were on board. The governor's office was on board. Um, but the Assembly Democrats were not there yet. Uh, and, you know, TBD on whether they're there, you know, next year in terms of supporting that. I think uh, it's definitely tricky to, to say to, say, an upstate utility that's a gas-only utility. We're going to prevent you from ever having additional customers. Uh, and... Uh, they're pushing back hard. I mean, the fossil fuel industry spent money running ads, you know, attacking Hochul over this issue. Uh, and they were, you know, if you look at it from the results, they were successful in the sense that it didn't happen uh, this past year. And now the Climate Council is considering pushing back the whole timeline about a year because of the way that the international building codes are coming out later and they need more time to sort of integrate it if they do it through the Building Codes Council rather than just legislatively. Do you, do you get the sense that there's uh, opportunity to come back next year and try again? Like, was this a, a temporary setback or? It's it's not an election year. Mm. Which I think uh, will we'll definitely make it a little easier for some people to support it. You know, whether the, the results of the election actually, you know, hurt that goal is, uh, is you know, talk to me week after the election, please. Thank you. Sure, <laughs> sure. Um, so that's for new buildings. Um, what about all the old buildings? Uh, you know, it's it's a lot easier to, to fit the new technology into a brand new design than a retrofit, which is expensive and time consuming, but you got a lot of old buildings. So um, have you reported on any kind of promising policy efforts to uh, try to try to reach the existing built environment? Yeah, I don't know about promising, but there is a law <laughs> called Local Law 97, and it, I mean, if you live in New York City, you probably have heard about it, um, but it, it mandates that every building over a certain amount of square feet, I believe it's 25K, uh, it has to have emissions limits that they have to meet, um, and I think a lot of them, do. the, the city says most of the buildings um, that will, you know, need to adhere to this law already meet those caps or will with very, very few retrofits. Um, but that's sort of the big question, like how do they do this? <laughs> how are they going to pay for it? Um, and it's different when it's you know maybe a luxury condo building versus these little, or I shouldn't say little because they're over 25k uh, square feet. But you know these these sort of like lower middle class co-ops in the middle of Brooklyn or something like that um, that really do run on you know fuel uh, boilers that would just put them over the emissions limit or they have to retrofit or figure out how to you know pop in heat pumps <laughs> uh, and do all these different fixes um, it's like how are they going to do that physically how does that construction work and how are they going to pay for it is, are the big questions um, and these laws i mean they have to start complying by 2024 but the rules for like what guides the laws and how they would even calculate their emissions and their penalties are just haven't haven't been finalized yet so we're still waiting on that and, and I imagine you don't want to be, as a building owner, making investments and picking new technologies until all the details are laid out so you don't get dinged for something you, you didn't expect? Yeah. I mean, the way I've seen it in my reporting so far is, you know, there's some buildings where their co-op boards or whoever manages it are really on top of this. And they've been asking the questions and starting to sort of roll forward some of these retrofits. Um, but they don't know the final you know, they don't know the final rules. They don't know what it's going to look like at the end. Uh, and then there's others that have just sort of pushed it off and they are really under capacity or they ha they don't have the money to hire these consultants that will do this work for them. Um, so I think they're going to have to either get with it really soon or, I don't know, they'll have to get some, you know, financial penalties as per the law. Uh, one thing, uh, maybe it's, it seems obvious, but I was a little surprised to learn that, like, space is also constraint for electrification in New York City buildings. Like, where do you put that heat pump? Or, or when you're swapping out the existing infrastructure, it ultimately changes the footprint and can conflict with what's there. And so that was, uh, if we think about space constraint from a solar standpoint, that's kind of obvious. But this is an additional challenge, just figuring out where things go. Um, there's another, there's an initiative, uh, the Empire Building Challenge, that's also working, um, I, I believe it's a voluntary effort, um, but also kind of going after these 
large existing uh, high rises. And it's interesting, there's a, a set I remember reading that you could get toward 80% electrification kind of using existing technologies with retrofits with massive uh, reductions in energy consumption. Obviously that costs money, but it's sort of encouraging in some ways to think that you don't need some totally new gadget to get most of the way there. Yeah, I, I mean, it, it does strike me that the building space, I mean, it's, it's earlier kind of across the clean energy industry. Uh, you know, if, if you're getting solar, you're saving money at this point. Uh, and if you're doing community solar in New York, you're, you're definitely saving money. Um, it seems much less clear and, and very site specific on the, on the electrifying the buildings. Uh, you know, it's harder to get mass buy-in if uh, the, the appliances themselves aren't sort of well known and out in the, in the public zeitgeist. So uh, that seems challenging. This is one where, you know, a lot of the southwestern states, it's just not the same kind of need to heat uh, in very bitterly cold winters. Um, so I don't envy this, this challenge for y'all. Um, let's go on to our last section, and then we're going to get audience questions after, after this. But we, we want to get into the, the energy equity uh, topic, which is you know crucial. They, there's all these changes, but um, in the process of transitioning the, the economy and the energy system, um, is this data accounting for people who've been hurt and, and harmed by the, the old polluting forms uh, and where, where the facilities are sited, whose backyard it's in? Um, and also uh, there's the workforce dimension of you know, changing the way the economy works to different fuel sources and, and are, are workers able to have a, a foothold in the new world? Um, and then, you know, we've raised the issue of cost, and a lot of these changes are being driven by policies, and, you know, someone's bearing the cost for that. So I think that'll be good to, to dig into. Um, so uh, I think one energy equity policy that New York, has, New York City has done, I, and, and I don't know if anyone else has done something quite like this, is this uh, rule on dirty peaker plants. So these are the fossil fuel plants that are rarely used, but they fire up when, when there's really intense demand. So summer heat wave, everyone's running the air conditioning, and they, they tend to be the dirtiest uh, facilities on the grid, and, and a lot of them in, in town here are also 50, 60 years old. Um, so there is a rule to, uh, to, to, to do something about that, n noting that they're often cited in disadvantaged communities or minority communities. Um, so anyone want to fill our audience in on like with the status of this rule? Um, yeah. So the it's a it's a statewide. You know the DEC says you know we have too many of these peakers that are emitting a lot of NOx emissions, which are you know create the smog and have very harmful uh, health effects. So we're going to start to phase phase those out. You know 2023 um, some of these regulations go into effect. Some peakers have already started to shut down. Um, more will be shutting down in 2023 2025 um, time frame. And uh, right now, you know, it's, it's sort of a question as the New York Independent System Operator looks at those plans, um, can New York City still reliably keep the lights on? And so far, in terms of their short-term reliability assessments, they've said, yeah, it looks like we'll be okay, but there are some definite issues uh, in the coming years if some other things happen. If demand is higher than we expect, if there's uh, an extreme heat wave, if there is, you know, um, if Chippy, uh, the Champlain Hudson Power Express, doesn't come online, you know, when it's currently forecasted to come online, uh, there could be some reliability issues that the NISO itself has said, you know, this could mean that the peakers need to stay on longer. Hmm. Yeah, well, and then on a fundamental level, I mean, so this is very important work to be you know, getting rid of the most harmful of the of the old polluting plants. Um, if you are shutting down those peakers in New York and not building batteries, uh, which would be this sort of zero emission on demand technology that's available today to replace them, uh, how how long can you keep doing that of shutting down your your in city capacity and then not building new firm capacity to replace it? Well, I don't think batteries. Right now, battery storage technology is not necessarily a one-to-one -one replacement for peakers, right? We don't 
necessarily have a battery that can run for several days or you know 12 plus hours and batteries need to recharge which puts an additional demand on the grid afterwards so i think um the expectation is more that offshore wind and transmission lines coming into the city will play a bigger role in replacing the peakers than perhaps battery storage although that's I don't think that's entirely true because I think there will be a, a role for batteries to play for sure. Yeah. Yeah. No, don't, they definitely don't want to offend any of the battery developers. We don't, we, yeah. <laughs> yeah. They can be useful to have, but you're right. They don't, they don't go for 24 hours straight. Um, but, but that's interesting. So getting back to the sort of por portfolio emerging, if you don't have power sources generating in the city, but you have offshore wind pumping in from, from the ocean, that's, you know, able to connect into the grid you maybe don't need the same capacity operating within city boundaries as we used to. Ooh, now you're getting into like locational reserve <laughs> margin Yeah, yeah, so we, well, we don't need to go, and, uh, go too far down that route. <laughs> um, <laughs> but let's talk about the just transition for workers. Um, I was very intrigued by a piece that my colleague Maria did uh, recently on um, how the terminal uh, in, in Brooklyn is seeing new new a uh, new future coming as the shift to clean energy happens so can you talk about what what sort of new jobs new economic drivers are happening in the city uh as a result of this shift yeah so there's um a project actually in, in sunset park brooklyn um but not too far from where i live um to transform this abandoned uh the south brooklyn marine terminal which hasn't been used for decades uh into a hub for storing and assembling and repairing offshore wind farms um or sorry, offshore wind turbines that will go to service the wind farms that Equinor and BP are developing off the coast of New York. And the uh, local community, especially groups like Uprose, New York City Environmental Justice Alliance, have been very involved in, in kind of uh, having a say in what kind of project comes to the waterfront, but then also now that it's going to be this offshore wind hub, making sure that they have a seat at the table and kind of being being engaged, the, their goal is to make sure that those jobs, which the primarily will be construction jobs at the site to start, but then um, hundreds kind of involved in the turbine assembly and um, kind of operations there, uh, they, they want to make sure that Sunset Park residents are actually working at that hub that's going up in their backyard, especially um, sort of given the history of environmental justice issues in that area. Speaking of peaker plants, uh, there's a couple nearby in Sunset Park. There's also a lot of heavy truck traffic, other industrial facilities that contribute kind of an outsized share of pollution to the neighborhood. Yeah, and um, Sam or Maria, have, have you covered any other instances of, of new new job creation that's kind of giving giving the community uh, more of a voice and a say in the, in the, the emerging clean energy system? Yeah, I mean, I think one thing that pops up a lot, especially in New York with, uh, you know, the retrofits on the horizon to get buildings uh, cleaner is um, just teaching people and people who have been like traditionally left out of the workforce uh, and doing a lot of job development to, to teach them how to do these installations, whether that's like solar panels or, um, you know, home retrofits. And today I know this big company called Block Power, which probably a lot of you know, uh, just announced sort of a, a wider um, an expansion of their job training program. Um, and it sort of, uh, you know, dovetails with the criminal justice and, um, you know, interrupting violence in certain neighborhoods. Uh, but that's been really interesting to see. And that's, uh, I mean, I think with every sort of clean energy promise, there's always the flag that people wave about jobs coming. Um, and so we're sort of, you know, it's to be seen, but some of the training is happening now, which is pretty interesting. Um, and the other concern is, you know, jobs that will be lost, uh, which is something that comes up a lot with uh, it, the state policies in general, less I think about the city here. Um, but, you know, fossil fuel workers, for example, are really concerned that they will be left out or, uh, you know, won't have jobs to go to in a decade or less. Um, and, and I think Marie can speak more about this, but, you know, those sort of concerns um, manifested in a new policy that actually did get, you know, it was a law that got passed uh, in the session last time. It was really like labor and environmentalists coming together um, to pass this, this bill that would um, mandate geothermal network pilots uh, in the city and around the state for each utility. Yeah, I think that was definitely, um, you know, as you, as you mentioned, I think it's a, an example of, of labor really flexing its, its power. Um, we've seen labor do that a few times, but that bill in particular, I think, as it gets implemented, will tell us a lot about sort of what the future of some gas utilities is. You know, 
is there going to be a way for them to create a new business model where they're delivering the service of heat rather than the service of gas to combust to create heat in your home? Um, and I think there's a lot of there's a lot of questions of the, about that. The Public Service Commission uh, members have been kind of critical about the timeline for that legislation. Uh, they don't, they they're like we're we're going to need more time to figure some of this out. So they're giving the utilities a little bit more time to flesh out their pilot ideas and uh, actually implement them. Um, but those those should be really interesting to watch and um, to see you know how labor gets to play a role in in shaping those as well. Yeah. Great. Well, so then let's talk about affordability. Um, is a macro level inflation happening and energy is, is costing families more and more? Uh, there's a lot of programs here that, you know, are, are not really market driven at this point. Um, I think the, you know, generally speaking, the clean energy is, is competitive and that'll be cheaper in the long run than um, equivalent fossil fuels. But then once you get into all the all the work that it takes to keep the system reliable costs can start adding up and uh, as we mentioned retrofitting all the old buildings is a whole whole big thing um so can you talk about you know in general how is new york state paying for all of these uh you know rather leading efforts to to change the uh, away from fossil fuels maybe marie that's the several hundred billion dollar question um i you know i think that's TBD for sure. I mean, right now, obviously, the Climate Action Council is, is talking about that finally. Um, I've sat through so many meetings, guys. <laughs> My how, how long are these meetings? Uh, roughly, some of them, now they're, they're down to about three hours at a time. That's the uh, slim I'm, there's, version. There's been longer That's, ones. Okay. Uh, mm. But so, you know, right now, the thing they talked about was like, could we do a carbon tax or could we do some type of cap and invest economy wide on, you know, um, greenhouse gas emissions. And basically, I think it, a lot of it's going to come down to legislative willpower uh, in the upcoming session, but also, you know, what they can actually do on the executive side without legislation, because there is pretty vast authority in the climate law for the DEC to, to implement regulations um, to support the plan. And then what about, you know, just utility customers paying their bills and, and money going from those to kind of fund f pilot programs and all the various things? Yeah, well, the way that this clean energy market will be set up, the economy really is through like subsidies and uh, other sorts of like benefits to, um, I'm forgetting the word anyway, but uh, basically it's like on the taxpayers and on ratepayers, which is just people. Um, and there's been no accounting for what that might cost. There's no real projections. Uh, and I think that's a big question mark in people's minds. Um, there's always the promise and, you know, it's, we've seen it bear out in some, some cases that, you know, clean energy is cheaper than fossil fuels. Um, but ultimately, we just don't know how much it's going to fall onto the individual consumer uh, to really like push these programs forward and to sort of um, under underwrite them essentially. Um, and already in the past year, in part because of the pandemic, we've seen really uh, high like cases of um, utility debts that lots of people have. And I haven't looked at the numbers in a while, but they were they were just far and uh, away the highest numbers that we've seen, basically. Um, so that's a real crisis. <laughs> we don't know how necessarily people are going to pay that um, and, and just how they will sort of burden, uh, you know, share this burden and, and uh, be able to afford it, essentially. And I don't know the extent to which this will kind of trickle down to individuals, but the Inflation Reduction Act, um, I think it was Nyserta said it should pump like seventy billion dollars into New York State th from now through 2050 in term in the form of, you know, tax credits for heat pumps or electric vehicles or in tax credits for utilities that previously couldn't um, participate in those programs like rural co-ops and municipalities. Um, so that uh, I, I believe this was Nyserta said this it that money that seventy billion won't necessarily accelerate the clean energy transition here, but it will make it more affordable, at least in, in terms of helping to pay for some of, some of those programs. That's a nice little bump to get. Yeah, it's, I, everything we've been talking about has a tax credit from the federal government, uh, thanks to the Inflation Reduction Act that passed this summer. So um, that will change the trajectories there a bit. So, OK, it sounds like the, the, the cost thing, there's some question marks here. And um, you know, I'm sure the long-term political buy-in on a transition will will rely on showing people that whatever costs they might be asked to bear 
uh, seem worthwhile and lead to, you know, long term saving. You know, what if you have a highly efficient electric house, you're spending less to heat and cool it and, and you know, your electricity costs less, but it's it's getting there. And how do you make sure enough people are getting those benefits um, that they, you know, want to keep keep participating in it? Um, so I have a few kind of fun grab bag topics uh, that are, are outside of those three categories, but then we will get to questions. We'll have a, you know, 15-ish minutes for audience questions. I believe, yeah, there's some mics in the aisle. Um, so you can think about your questions, maybe start heading that way in two two or three minutes. But um, I was very intrigued this summer to watch some, some action in Albany uh, around this idea of public renewables. Um, there's a, f a fairly robust, uh, you know, political coalition trying to push this idea of getting uh, the the you know public uh, power entities in New York to to just start developing more renewables themselves and and rely less on private uh, you know uh, sort of market driven actors who are in it to to make some money. Uh, that didn't actually pass, but it got pretty far. And um, maybe Maria, can you? Catch us up briefly on you know what the actual policy idea was there and and what that would have meant for this clean energy transition. Um, yeah, so the it's it's uh, called the Build Public Renewables Act. Um, essentially, it had a lot of different components, which I've written many many stories about. Uh, but fundamentally, it's about allowing the New York Power Authority to build more renewables. Um, the New York Power Authority said it doesn't want to do that or at least not in the way that the bill itself was written uh, to kind of make them do that and make them supply some customers that they don't currently serve. Um, so that idea definitely got a lot of traction, a lot of attention, some really, um, you know, if you want to study like social organizing campaigns in New York, that's definitely one you should look at in terms of, you know, how to really move the conversation and, and pressure lawmakers to, to take something seriously. Um, it's a really interesting example of that. Um, but but it didn't ultimately get through, I think, because, you know, a lot of lawmakers weren't familiar with it. There was some opposition from NIPA itself. Uh, the assembly didn't really take it up uh, and didn't really um, feel like they had time to fully vet it um, through their staff. So that didn't end up happening. Um, we'll definitely see it again next session, uh, I believe. You know, I think it, that's and that's sort of like a step that the Democratic Socialists see like toward getting public power, public power being, let's get rid of an investor owned utilities and have public power authorities deliver the power to people. Yeah, and, and would that actually accelerate the switch to clean energy or is it more about um, changing out of who the actors are who are, who are leading the shift? Um, I think it's kind of hard to say that NIPA definitely has said like, we don't really think this would give, we don't think we have a real big advantage in building renewables. The private market is kind of responding. You know, the state says we've we've got these RFPs out on the street. We've gotten a really good response. We've got contracts. NIPA wouldn't be exempt from siting regulations. I mean, they'd still have to get permits and deal with you know impacts to wetlands and forests and you know visual impacts to their neighbors. So uh, I, I think it would it could affect you know the way it's structured, but would it, it vastly accelerate the progress on 70% by 2030? Um, not many people agree with that. Okay, gotcha. Um, <laughs> well, moving on. Uh, so Hurricane Sandy hit uh, 10 years ago, in a, the anniversary is just a couple days away, actually. Um, that kicked off a whole flurry of Conversations about resilience and how to how to avoid the kind of blackouts that hit a lot of sections of the city, and um, launched a, a, a thing called New York Prize that was a, a effort to get microgrids built to do local resilience. Um, so, decade later, w how much has happened to you know build microgrids in New York and and prevent that kind of uh, power outage that happened? I mean, from my perspective, from what I understand, it's less about the microgrids that have been built out because they haven't oh, <laughs> very they haven't. much. Oh, uh, I think okay. there's been a little bit of movement. I, I'm honestly not super familiar with that terrain, but I, I can think of several projects in the back of my head that just never happened um, or maybe are still happening, depending on who you speak to. 
but I think I think what we have done and we, what we have seen is a lot of like shoring up some of our infrastructure um, around the MTA, around uh, substations. Uh, Con Ed has done a lot of work kind of like hardening uh, what they've got. Uh, so that way, you know, hopefully we don't see as many power outages when the next storm comes. OK, still waiting on the microgrids. That, that might come <laughs> later. Um, you know, Canary Media will be around in 10 years, and we'll come back and, uh, and do a, a little benchmarking there. So um, I'd love for anyone who wants to ask a question to start heading up. Uh, just wanted to ask, this is more for, well, the real energy nerds out there. But a few years ago, there was this thing called New York Rev. It was the reforming the energy vision. We talked a lot about it. We wrote stories about it. It was going to remake the relationship of customers and utilities. Um, but I haven't seen it in press releases in a long time. Is that still happening? New York Rev, anyone? I think we should get Victoria up here to talk about, about Rev. <laughs> um, it's, uh, if you talk to uh, the commissioner, the chairman of the PSC, he, he remembers Rev. Um, so, you know, it's, it's, not, it's not the flashy thing in the press releases anymore, and it, we didn't fix, you know, we didn't fundamentally change the way the utility system works it still kind of works the same way that it did when Sandy happened. Um, I mean, the idea was to make it a platform and, you know, have, I mean, it was a pro-ESCO sort of uh, model even, I would say. But that hasn't happened. The utility system kind of works the same way. They did make some progress on some different things. You know, they have, like, sort of the, I don't even want to say that acronym, so I won't. But they, they have different, like, plans and, like, policies and different pilots that came out of REV that I think have shown, you know, some, some promise. Okay, still reforming in the background. Um, well, let's get some audience questions in. Let's keep them brief. Uh, please introduce yourself so we know who you are, and then ask a, a question, and then we'll answer it. Thanks. Hi, uh, my name is Jason. Uh, I just had a qu it was briefly brought up at, towards the end about the Inflation Reduction Act being passed and the amount of money coming in to the state. Uh, obviously, a lot of consumer tax credits. I had a question: uh, Is there been any excitement or w any response really? about um, the manufacturing credits that could be a lot of jobs or in economic activity for the state. I'm just curious if you've heard anything about that. I, I think um, definitely I think you're going to see a lot of um, projects try to take advantage of those. Um, you know, even the Port of Albany, when it uh, decided that it didn't want a federal grant, you know, kind of mentioned that the offshore wind manufacturers that are coming, hopefully coming to their new site, uh, would be able to take advantage advantage of some of the IRA tax credits for their project. Hmm. Any other thoughts? Yeah. Sounds good. Over here. Hi, I'm Lindsay. Julian, you wrote such an interesting article about Hawaii's development of the two-way grid and using electric vehicles um, synced together to send lots of energy to the grid, plus um, battery storage people might have privately. What's going to make that happen in New York State and New York City? That's a great question. Well, thank you for the plug for Canary Media reporting. <laughs> uh, everyone go check it out. Um, but yeah, th so in, in response to the island of Oahu shutting down its coal plant, they are filling the gap in part by asking households to uh, share power from their solar power stored in their home batteries with the grid in the in the evening hours and they're paying people like thousands of dollars to sign up for this program so that that is definitely one way to get clean power onto the grid um, have any of you covered any any efforts like this in New York is that is that in the works sort of sounds like a virtual power plant sort of style thing. yeah yeah exactly yeah, I know there are some pilots around that um, yeah. for sure I'm not off the top of my head, I wouldn't be able to cite one, though. I believe Revel had a, and correct me if I'm wrong, but yeah, they had a pilot in New York, in, in the city, I should say, um, that was sort of doing uh, the grid, the two-way grid sort of situation, which is promising, but still a pilot. Yeah, Revel is a um, like a, a car share company, electric cars, and they, they have a um, EV charging hub. I believe that's the site of the vehicle to grid. Uh, pilot. Gotcha, gotcha. I mean, I do know it's really hard to install a lithium-ion battery anywhere in the city because of the, the fire code and concerns about fire safety there. So a, a precursor to doing that kind of program is having thousands of households with batteries. Um, so you got to figure out a way to do that first, probably. But may, maybe upstate, you know, 
with the rooftop solar and all that distributed solar. But uh, yeah, sounds like it's not in the works so much in New York so far. Over here. All right. Hey, uh, my name's Russell. I'm a community solar multifamily developer in Brooklyn. Um, so we're, I'm really worried right now about sort of NYSERDA's future plans for the megawatt block program. Uh, you know, IRA passed and, you know, they're talking about the upstate, you know, money being sort of reevaluated. Um, I was wondering if anyone had any insights about like NYSERDA's plan for, you know, community sp solar, especially in New York City, Con Ed territory, you know, as that, you know, line gets smaller and smaller in the megawatt block program. I, I know what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> uh, so that's a really interesting question, and I think it's it's part of a larger question as we look at the IRA money coming into the state, as to whether you know state policymakers are like, oh great, so we can make it less costly for ratepayers overall by reducing our subsidies, and just using some of the federal subsidies instead. And I think that's kind of what you're asking. You know, is the state going to do that? And um, Based on some comments from the Public Service Commission at some of their meetings, I would not be surprised if they started to look at ways that they could scale back, you know, the money coming out of everyone's electric bill and being like, well, you're getting a federal subsidy, so you should still be doing the same project, you're getting the same amount of money, and we're not going to give you an additional adder to, to do this project. But uh, I'd love to talk to you more about it. <laughs> okay, so that's actually, so it's like uh, you could, in theory, keep subsidizing from state funds, add the federal subsidies and build more clean energy that way, or take the federal ones and, and draw down the, the amount you would have given from state sources and you, you end up with the same amount, but it's, it's less costly and that's gonna be something for every state to decide, I guess. Yeah, okay, that was a good, I, I, that was over my head, but that, the answer <laughs> I, I thought was interesting. So uh, yeah, you over here. My name is Hans. Uh, although the discussion has centered mostly in New York City, a lot of people who work and commute uh, live in suburbs. And what we're seeing in the suburbs. Here, here for the suburbs. Anyone here from the suburbs? <laughs> more. All right. Okay, Jersey. All right. More and more Mac mansions coming up. Mm. And I was wondering if there is any chance that New York State follow the more enlightened parts of this country that demands a so solar and electric self-sufficiency of new construction? Ooh, that's a really good question. Yeah, so, so some states, California included, actually do require solar on new homes, which could fit well with the all electric home requirements. Is that on the table in New York? I haven't seen a one that like a proposal that requires that specifically. I mean, the the proposal to require you know ban um, combustion of fossil fuels in new construction definitely also entails you know extremely efficient building codes, electric ready in the turn in the sense that you know they can support an EV, and so theoretically I, I suppose support solar. But I am not sure that the the plan right now calls for solar and batteries in every home to, to make sure that your new house, you know, in the middle of nowhere is uh, in the middle of nowhere being like upstate New York, I, I guess. <laughs> oh, okay. All right. Familiar with those areas. Yes. <laughs> and also with those lawmakers get on board. <laughs> you over here. Yeah. Hi, my name's Wes. Uh, thanks for putting on a nice event. First of all, you get a nice space here too. Um, so back to offshore wind. So the theme that at least I took away from the, the answers and maybe the rest of us here, was delays. The delays may be on account of developers, on account of uh, the state, not really sure. But I'm interested in your views as to maybe what's driving those delays and, and what can be done to, to get things moving again. And then also what can be done to avoid those delays uh, for future uh, awarded projects. Some of the delays originally were around the lack of um, permitting processes at the federal and state levels that have since, over time, been resolved. So projects that maybe have been a decade in the works now have gotten over some of those hurdles, and that will help future projects going forward. Um, other delays, though, there continues to be pushback f 
in um, local communities that will be affected by where the uh, connection cables are coming on shore. Um, I, South Fork Wind is the project that's kind of moving, advancing farthest along in its construction off Long Island. And I know that there's um, concern, a lot of vocal opposition from the fishing and lobster communities about what, how that uh, undersea cable will affect the habitats. Um, I don't know if you wanted to add anything. Um, I would definitely agree with that, and I think particularly in terms of the federal permitting process at BOEM, there's obviously, uh, we had a, a different administration a little while ago. Uh, I don't, oh, I remember I don't, that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, and they were not huge fans of moving forward on offshore wind permits, uh, as far as I, I understand. And um, I think some of that's eased up, but I think there's also concern whether BOEM has enough staff to move some of these projects forward at the rate that um, I think the states would certainly like to see, you know, them move forward, so. And, and that touches on offshore, touches on federal jurisdiction, whereas onshore wind is, is more of a state level thing. Um, and I, I'd say generally across, I, I, anywhere you go, the first big projects are always the hardest in some sense because the, the processes haven't really been figured out yet. So at the very least those have been fleshed out more than they were five years ago or 10 years ago. Um, and I think we could do one more question and then we'll, uh, and then we'll wrap up here. Uh, Rob Parker from Zinc8 Energy Solutions, um, energy storage developer or technology company. Um, so echoing kind of what Marie had talked about on delays, uh, I think in, in the last question, uh, but also staffing. Uh, it's a three year wait for interconnect in energy storage installations right now. Um, Julian, you mentioned the PUC and working together in, in Hawaii to drive those changes, but here it's kind of a, it's a FERC problem or it's PUC versus NISO, but there's not a lot of either staffing at those levels and, and or just delays of who's responsible. Is there any discussions you've seen or, or conversations on driving that? You mentioned ORES staffing, so from staffing and for taking ownership of it like Hawaii had to do because those delays are only getting worse. Mm -hmm. Is that a NISO or a Con Ed inter interconnection process, or both? If you ask each one of them, they'll say it's the other one. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> we should talk. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I think that, that kind of says it, right, is the what's the, the staffing, who's responsible. I think um, NISO has definitely talked a little bit about trying to, to speed up their processes, but they're also dealing with way more projects than they've ever had to deal with coming in because because of the the number of contracts that the the state is issuing so and uh you know i'm not as familiar with the con ed uh, interconnection process um but i'm i'm sure if i asked them they'd say they're working on it <laughs> so <laughs> i think it's one of those uh maybe staffing, but also budget. It's one of those things that gets left out of, oh, we've given the subsidies for the developer of the project, but does the agency have the budget for staffing? Yeah, yeah, wow. Well, um, I think we've we've crushed an hour, like <laughs> almost without even thinking about it. Like I, I, that, was, that was a lot of ground to cover. I wasn't sure if we'd fit everything in, but we, we got through the, we got through the outline, we got through the questions. <laughs> um, I uh, am just really appreciative to all three of our, our panelists. What, what did you all think? What did you, did you like that? <laughs> yeah, I, I learned a lot. This is like the people, the, it's just fun to, it's rare to get to do a panel where it's all journalists and they all like really know what they're talking about. And, uh, and, and I also wanted to shout out, so S Sam's actually able to join us. Uh, she, she's normally teaching a, a class in journalism at the CUNY Grad School of Journalism on Thursday nights, but there, I think some students are here. My students we, are here. We, we like said, ah, bring the students. Like we, we like journalists here at Canary Media. So I'm um, glad that you could all make it. Uh, now I get to send you off to uh, more drinks and networking, and I'll be able to per partake more uh, indulgently now because we're done. Um, so please uh, meet someone new, you know, but the fact that you're here means you have some interest in common with everybody else who chose to be here tonight. Um, so yeah, make some new friends, some new, new potential colleagues, and uh, thanks for coming, everybody. See you out there. Thank you, everyone.
All right. Thank you. Welcome back. Thanks for the great questions um, and your enthusiasm for the first session. So now we're going to get on to the next session, which is a live taping of a podcast. So I'm Scott Clavenna. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Postscript Media. Uh, Stephen Lacey, uh, my co-founder, sends his love and regards. He couldn't make it. He's sick. So I'm here to usher in our first live recording of a Postscript Media podcast. So we're super excited for this. All right. So let me tell you a little bit about Postscript and then about Climavores. Uh, Postscript Media, um, Stephen Lacey and I uh, were at Green Tech Media. We spent a lot of time covering the energy transition for years and years. And um, along the way, fell in love with audio and podcasting. And then um, last year, started our company, Postscript Media. And it provides services to, to partners in podcast production, but it also does originals. And I think the, the originals is what I want to talk about here is after many years uh, covering the energy transition, we really thought about how to take that beyond just the industry and to everyone. Because we believe, and I think all of you know this, that climate is an everything story. And it's, it's not just about how the electricity grid is going to become clean or how energy sources are going to transition to renewables. It's about how all of our decisions, every industry, everything we do every day has an impact on the climate. And we're all a part of it. And as individuals, and we're all a part of it, is how we interact with systems and policies and politics. And how do you tell stories? How do you engage people on all of those levels? And so we've got uh, four or five new podcasts that uh, we want to talk about here. And, and then we're going to have a live taping of Climavores. Um, the five we've got, and, and sort of the origin story of those is two with Canary Media, our partners. And again, thank you to Nick and Canary Media for having us here. Really appreciate the, the venue to, to have this. So big shout out to them. Um, and two we do with Canary are The Carbon Copy. That's a weekly news magazine on uh, you know, issues in and events developing around how climate change is impacting the economy and culture. And then... Catalyst with Shale Khan, um, a brilliant uh, analyst and now venture capitalist, and he, he runs a great weekly interview podcast um, talking to really smart people about uh, technology, markets, and innovations in the climate tech uh, economy. And then the next thing we wanted to do in our originals is a little different from that, from the tech to just say, what is it that we do every day that interacts with this changing planet? And you can think about it in some ways is like when you get up in the morning, you make decisions in, within an hour every day. And those decisions are, what am I going to wear? What am I going to eat? And how am I going to get to where I'm going? And so three of the podcasts that we've uh, launched this summer are Hot Buttons, about the sustainable fashion industry. Climavores, about what we eat and uh, how to uh, feed the planet without frying the planet, as Mike likes to say. And um, Mode Shift is about how transit and how we get around in cities, how, how that's evolving to um, accept and, and uh, acknowledge the, the constraints of climate change, the challenges around that, and how we can do a better job of uh, commuting and getting around in, in cities um, as, as the planet changes. And so that's, that, you know, that brings us to Climavores. We get up every day. We make decisions about what we're going to eat. And I've had such a great time helping produce this podcast, not just because I love Mike and Tamar and, and the, the real enthusiasm and joy they bring to the, the research and the conversations they have, but how much I learn along the way. I mean, Mike and Tamar do something that really is like the represents the power of podcasting. They have the time to talk through the research, to challenge our notions about, um, or our preconceived notions about the food industry, about the food we eat, the choices we make, some of the things we take for granted, some of the things we thought were helping the climate but may not be, and other ones that we may just not know, the, you know decisions we can make that can be really powerful. And so it's, it's been a great um, honor to work with them and, and the learning along the way has been a lot of fun. And I found that the same with our other podcast, Hot Buttons, on the fashion industry. 
we buy clothes, we think about fashion as like what represents our identity and what do we like. And, um, but there's a lot that's going on uh, behind the scenes in the fashion industry that has a tremendous impact on um, the climate and on the environment that needs fixing. And again, I've learned a ton, I've enjoyed it. Our hosts are just tremendously fun, engaging people, and uh, that's what makes this job fun. And I hope uh, you guys check the podcast out because I think you learn and, and laugh and, and really um, enjoy that time each week with them. So now we will have our live taping of Climavores. And so what they're going to do, Tamar Haspel and Mike Grunwald, is uh, we thought, why don't we look at a plate of food? And, and the ideal plate to look at is the USDA's My Plate that you can find on myplate.gov. And it sort of represents the optimal, in their minds, the optimal healthy distribution of the different food groups that, that we um, should be eating. And it informs decisions in schools. It informs decisions uh, um, individually uh, around the country. And so we thought we'd look at that plate um, and look at it through a climate lens. And We've done that bit by bit over the last 16 episodes of the podcast, but we're going to give you the highlights and, and uh, uh, talk through that in, a, uh, in an enlightening way, as they have, and, um, and then we'll take your questions after that. All right, so this is a live taping of a podcast, so one of the things I've learned as a producer is before you start, you've got to have room tone. So what that means is for about 10 or 15 seconds, we have to be really quiet. So let's start with room tone. So nobody say anything for 10 minutes. The engineers love this. They get the, they get the background sound. So let's try that. Ten, 10 seconds of silence. Perfect. And then applause for Mike and Mike Grunwald and Tamar Haspel of Climavores. <laughs> So, 10 seconds of not talking is like the hardest thing we do. <laughs> it's, a, it's, our, it's a first, first time for everything. Um, well, we do want to start with a few thank yous, um, because starting with uh, Scott and Stephen our, and the entire PostScript team, we've just been incredible. Um, Very much so. Yeah, and, uh, and uh, the Canary folks also, um, just uh, just incredible. I'm, I'm lucky enough to be associated with both, because I am... And they're mostly an energy team. I'm the one outlier. I write a food and climate column for uh, for Canary, and uh, it's been a joy working with them. And they are, they just kill it every There's day. There's nothing like a professional. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Um, so, but th th again, thanks for and thanks to all of you for coming. We're uh, we're we're so fired up to be here in New York City. Uh, Tamar's living in the Cape. Um, I'm living in Miami. My my wife and my daughter are literally at a Pitbull concert tonight, <laughs> um, uh, Mr. 305. Um, but, and uh, my chickens are fending for themselves. <laughs> exactly, but uh, but you know we both have uh, a lot of New York roots. I, I think we still both have a Metro card. <laughs> exactly. So um, so let's start. I mean, Tamar is the nutrition guru of the two of us. I just uh, take my cue from her on that stuff. Um, and I know you uh, have some strong feelings about it. They haven't put it up yet. Oh, yeah, but we the, need uh, our My Plate. Give uh, us our the, My Plate. The, the, the My Plate uh, is, is something that you're, uh, you're a huge fan of. <laughs> All right. Well, now that the all? energy people have gone, we're going to get this party started. <laughs> so... And every good party starts with my plate. <laughs> so we're supposed to have a slide of it, but since we don't, I'll just describe it. So it's a plate, and this was the sum total of what the United States government worked on for many years since the 80s about telling people what to eat and how much of it to eat. And we could have a whole nother episode about what was good about that and what wasn't good about that. And if you follow the space, you probably know a little bit about that. But it sort of culminated in a super simple graphic of a plate that has four quadrants. Fruits, <laughs> da, 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 <laughs> fruits, vegetables, grains, and proteins. And Let's start, though, with that little circle of dairy. Dairy's a little bit of an outlier, 
And it's also, in all kinds of ways, I think it's a legacy category. Um, primarily, it's the legacy of the dairy lobby. And one of the reasons that dairy has been uh, a part of the guidelines since the guidelines began in the 80s, and my friend Marian Nessel, who was part of that, is in the room today, so I can't say anything wrong, and I uh, was that dairy farmers lobbied hard to, to have it be a part of it. And the truth is that nobody actually needs dairy, although there was a time when dairy was super important for kids, particularly, because children need more protein and more fat than adults, and it made sense for kids to drink milk. I hope that was when I was a kid, because my parents are here too, and they <laughs> made me drink a glass of milk with every meal until I was, I guess, 18, probably. <laughs> Do you still? Uh, on, only when I'm home. Well, <laughs> yeah. You came out all right. Yeah, yeah. So I guess it's not that bad. I don't know. Imagine how good I'd be otherwise. <laughs> and, <laughs> that's right. We don't have the counterfactual. <laughs> Um, and so, so dairy was important at one point. It was a relatively simple, affordable way for kids to get some of the nutrients they need. But the world has changed, and there aren't very many nutrients that Americans aren't getting enough of. And this is, we're talking about, when we talk about all this, a lot of the nutrition stuff, we're talking about America. We're talking about the developed world because the situation is, is obviously very different in the developing world, and we'll talk about that more when we get to some of the other sections. But uh, dairy isn't necessary. And don't get me wrong, it's delicious. Scott talked about you know the first decisions you make when you wake up and mine is to put heavy cream in my coffee. And I'm not really ready to live in a cheeseless world. And dairy is delicious. And and through all of this conversation, I don't want to forget that that's an important part of food. Food is joy. Food is deliciousness. Food is more than just its climate impact, but we have to talk about its climate impact. Yeah, and dairy is uh, it's a problem, unfortunately. Yes, it <laughs> is. Because, you know, pizza is great. <laughs> and, uh, um, and, you know, this is a little bit of a spoiler for everything we're going to talk about tonight and kind of if you haven't heard our podcast we talk about this all the time but the real problem is that cows suck <laughs> yeah. um cows are a disaster from from a climate perspective from an environmental perspective really but uh particularly from a climate perspective uh you've i'm sure heard about the uh, the burping and farting um, of methane which is a real problem their manure has all kinds of uh, nitrous oxide, which is another really powerful greenhouse gas. But the main problem with cows, and we talk about this constantly, but it is land. The earth is becoming a cattle pasture. Um, if you, you know, it's funny, being, right now we're in New York City, so it just feels like this is the world. <laughs> you know, we're surrounded by people, we're surrounded by buildings. Um, if you take cities like New York and Manila and Beijing and all the sprawl and all the suburbs and the highways and driveways all over the world, the human footprint on the land, that's about 1% of the earth. We're a rounding error. Yeah, exactly. The, the rest of it is pretty much split half and half between agriculture and nature. The nature is almost entirely forests and the agriculture is now 75, 80% either pastures or you know, grain that they're feeding to cows and, and, uh, and other livestock. So uh, you know, the more farms we have, the less nature we have. <laughs> and, the, and when we get rid of nature, when we deforest, when we burn it down, when we cut it down, um, that's a carbon bomb. And when, even when we plow it up. Exactly. It's uh, and this is uh, this is the reason that cows and I think you'll you'll get to see some charts later, um, but you know, beef is again spoiler hey, alert. Hey, we haven't gotten to the proteins yeah. part well, yet. Well, beef is like the disaster. It's uh, you know it's by far the by far the worst food food you can eat. But dairy is way up there. It's even worse than, than chicken and pork. And that's pretty amazing when you think that like, you know, an entire chicken's life 
it only makes one serving, you know, it only makes chicken once, you know, a pig's life, they make pork once. You know, cows are making dairy all the time, and it's still just a huge, huge suck um, on, uh, on our land, on our water, on our, you know, they're creating all kinds of environmental, you know, their, their poop is, you know, the huge, you know, if you, you see these algal blooms, a lot of it is because of cows. So, uh, you know, we're, we're a broken record about this. And there, there, there are two major issues with cows. And one of them, I think, is really accessible and approachable and obvious. They burp methane. They're ruminants, they eat grass, and a byproduct of their digestion is methane. And that's really easy. And to be fair, there, there are things that people are working on to, to make sure that they burp a little less methane, and that's really important. And we're enthusiastic about like feed additives that are made from seaweed. But the thing that Mike was saying about the land use is just as important, if not more important, and it's a lot harder to grasp. And this is the conversation that I end up having with people all the time, because you sort of feel like, OK, well, if I'm buying beef from my local guy and they're doing everything right, um, then uh, how can my beef affect land use in the Amazon? Because I'm buying American beef. But this is a global thing. And if we have a world that's basically half agriculture and half stuff we need to protect from agriculture, every steak you eat, every glass of milk you drink adds to the global demand, which is going to push us over into this 50% that we're trying to protect. It's not intuitive, but it's super important. And it's, and you know, if, as long as we're already pissing people off. I That's mean, our yeah, specialty. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, unfortunately, like the, you know, the, People already thinking, oh yeah, but what if uh, you know, that? Uh, what if you, you mentioned, oh, your local farm that's that's doing it right? Well, the big nasty massive industrial dairy, from a climate perspective, is probably doing it better. Um, if the the more you know, the more land it takes to uh, to raise a cow, um, the more you know, basically the more emissions you're getting per calorie. And as uh, it's as, it's one of the conundrums of of animal products and their climate impact because sometimes the most efficient processes are the best for the climate but the worst for animal welfare. That's right. That's right. And uh, and you know now we may be I mean one thing we before we uh, you know we're kind of sneaking towards uh, I know. We're, toward, we're towards like, we're protein <laughs> I think but before I think one thing we should say about dairy um, that's really exciting is that there actually is an alternative that people like. Um. It's true, <laughs> and it's one of the places where there's been, re in fact, it's probably one of the only places where there's been real progress in replacing a food that's not climate friendly with a food that's more climate friendly. But all you have to do is say oat milk on Twitter, <laughs> and all hell breaks loose. Right? No, it is it is true. But uh, but 15, in the United States, 15 percent of all milk consumption is now plant based milk. Um, we did a. And we did an episode with like, it was got plant-based milk and, and it's it's one of the most obvious things because if you look at any metric of of these plant-based milks even you know you've probably heard that almonds use all this water which is true but there's still a better option a way better option. We, right. hey Mike what's only the one, one thing that right. uses more water than almond milk cows yeah. <laughs> and, and it's just again it from a from an environmental perspective, it is not close. Cows are such a disaster, and when you think about it, it makes sense that you know, sort of drinking plants directly as opposed to drinking stuff that's been you know basically plants filtered through an animal that you know had to had to you know they ate those plants, but they had to make a snout and they had to or they had to make a, a tail they had to poop lots of poop lots of poop they have to stay alive they have to have a respiratory system all that energy that's being poured into stuff that isn't milk or meat it's extremely inefficient while plant-based milk you know one of the things that people criticize about it is that it's you know in many ways it's kind of empty it's empty it's just it's, it's just oats water. and water right but uh Great. If it fills you up and without without destroying the planet, that's fantastic. And we did one to sort of 
cut to the, uh, what everybody asks is, okay, but um, you know, of soy milk, almond milk, oat milk, which should we drink if, we're, uh, if, we, if we shouldn't be drinking dairy milk? And the answer is, whichever one you like. They're all so much better than, than cow milk that if you find one that you can actually replace your, your cow consumption, you're, uh, you're ahead of the game. And people will make the case, and they're correct, that dairy milk has nutrients that those don't have. It has protein that those don't have. It has a higher fat content, which some people think is a good thing. Um, and, but we in America are overnourished. <laughs> So having a substitute... We have substitute, plenty of fat, I've noticed. <laughs> <laughs> I have my own personal store. Um, so, so having less of those things, especially less protein, has been the darling of, of the nutrition community. But how many of us have taken another slice of cheese and told ourselves, oh, protein, protein? And, and so in a world of overabundance, in a place where people are generally overfed, having something that is less nutritious but more climate friendly is a good bargain. Or so says me. So says Mike also, by the way. <laughs> so I think we should do some protein. Oh, huh? let's do protein. Because we've already started on cows, so we're halfway there already. <laughs> exactly. So, exactly. And so Mike can talk about cows for a very long time. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're both kind of cow bores. <laughs> yeah, um, we are. <laughs> but, uh, but you did mention uh, that, there, there ha you know, that one way that we've improved our, our climate impact of our food is by switching from, from you know, cow milk to other milks, and really, Hopefully that trend will continue. You know, alternative mm -hmm. altern alternative milk has been around now for 30 years, almost 40. Um, another way that we really have made a huge climate difference. I wrote about this in Canary, is that there's been a dramatic shift from beef consumption to chicken consumption. Right. In the in the developed in the developed world, the world is meeting much more meat. And as we hit 10 billion people on Earth, um, we are going to eat even more meat. As you know, people in China and India, the first thing people do when they leave poverty, um, which is great, is they start is eat eating meat. more meat. And that's, from a climate perspective, not so great. Um, you know, it's great because meat is delicious, and it is, it is in some ways And again, nutritious. in the developing world, right. there are still places where people get insufficient protein. There are still places where, uh, where there's child stunting, and that's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about the kinds of quantities of meat we eat in the United States and the developed world. And I want to talk about pigs and chickens, but before I do that, I want, I want to address this issue of uh, regenerative grazing oh yeah because there it's my like beef, my burger's okay it's grass-fed right so grass-fed is this no. get out of climate impact free card <laughs> and and it's 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 such a dicey issue because um it's absolutely true that you can graze cattle in ways that can sequester some carbon it's even true that in some particular it's circumstances, <laughs> no, no, it's totally true. That, Mostly true. That <laughs> <laughs> All right, it's, it's true. It's hard to document. <laughs> so, but it, you can even graze them such that they will sequester enough carbon um, to outweigh their enteric methane, the methane that they burp. But there is no way that we can graze cattle to outweigh the land use problem. And right now, carbon neutral beef is magical thinking. And if you're getting grass fed beef and you're thinking that's a better choice than other beef, it's probably not. Because most of the grass fed beef in the United States is not grazed in that way. It's grazed in ways that are, it, possibly, usually not regenerative, but possibly even destructive. And if it's regenerative, it's probably worse from a carbon perspective because they're probably putting less cows, fewer cows on that land, right. which they, means they, they need more are. land to make the same amount of cows, which means some of it's coming out of the Amazon again. And I know what you're thinking. <laughs> you're thinking you want Mike and me at your next dinner party because <laughs> we are a real hit. <laughs> That's bad. That's bad. <laughs> you can eat that. And, 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 and we're math geeks. 
And so much of carbon, of the climate impact of food is math. And, and people don't, people want the picture of the cattle regenerating the pasture. That's so much more appealing than the damn math, but the damn math matters. And I guess that's right. why we're employed. Right. And, and there really is, I mean, you hear, you hear a lot about this idea that we're going, it's this kind of land sharing idea that it's like, okay, we can have, yeah, sure, half the world is an animal farm, but that's okay, because uh, what is it? Four per thousand is the name of the big kind of regenerative ag movement. And because their idea is if you just increased soil carbon on agricultural lands by 0.4 percent, um, basically you'd solve the entire climate problem. But it's Good like one of those that. things that said, like, if we just had lots of money in this bank vault, we would have we'd be very, very rich. But nobody has really explained how we're going to get that money in there. And nobody has really shown that you can store a lot of carbon in that soil. As we can talk, we'll talk about later, you know, you, we know, we know how to store carbon in a forest. We know how to store carbon in a tree. But the main way you store more carbon in a in an agricult a piece of agricultural soil is either you convert it from cropland to pasture, and then you gotta grow some crops somewhere else and probably the Amazon <laughs> or or you're gonna have to put more manure on it, which is fine, but where'd you get the manure from? So again, it's a lot of this robbing Peter to pay Paul when the fact is, you know, animal agriculture is really inefficient. And, you know, when it comes to the cows, which at least get a little bit more free reign and are, you know, they're not in a cage or a, a crate like chickens or pigs. Um, but uh, they just, just not good okay, from a now that we've no. driven a stake through the heart of grass-fed cows, <laughs> let's move on to pigs. <laughs> um, and uh, like so much of the climate advice is eat less meat. And that's true. But there's a huge difference between uh, chicken and pork, which are about the same. Chicken is a little bit better than pork from a climate standpoint. And beef. So the impact of pork is something on the range of what 10% of the impact of beef. So if you want to cut down on your climate impact, and switching from from beef to pork is a great way to do it. You don't have to go all the way to lentils, but we will talk about that. And so Tamar likes lentils. That's Tamar, a, it's yeah, a theme in the show. Also, it's, it's my thing. Um, <laughs> I know, I need a more exciting thing. But uh, <laughs> I've, been writing, <laughs> I've been writing about food too long. Um, so pigs and chickens are way better at turning feed into meat than cows are. They grow a lot faster. So if you take, take your average pig. So pigs, for starters, are really fertile. So a sow can have over 20 piglets in a year. She can have more than one litter, whereas a cow can have one calf. So if you're looking at climate impact, the climate impact of the steer that you eat has to include an entire year of the mother's life because uh, that's the only way to account for it. Right, and a year of burping and farting uh, right. and eating and pooping. Yeah. <laughs> and bad cow, bad. Yeah. And Move. whereas a pig, um, first of all, is one of 20 plus piglets that sow can have in a year. So you only have one 20th of the life of the sow. But also a pig, and people are surprised by this, a pig reaches market weight, which is about 260 pounds, in six months. They are growing machines. Now, my husband and I have raised pigs a couple of times. And you can read all about it in my book, which you should buy. And uh, to boldly grow, it's really great. It's <laughs> Thank funny. you very much. Um, and it they they grow astonishingly quickly. You know, they're also smart and personable. And this idea that we raise them for food is it, it's it 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 grates it because it's like raising your dog for food. And so there are serious animal welfare concerns. Especially since one of the reasons that they, you know, they grow so fast. I mean, you look at chickens, which grow even faster, right? Yeah, they, get, they get to their 
you know, slaughter weight in six weeks, and they and they're so top heavy and fat that they can't even, you know, they're often breaking their legs because they can't stand. Um, it's uh, it's so, kind of gross. And this is one of the reasons uh. that when the if you're choosing from a pure climate impact chicken versus pork chicken is a right. little better it's but efficient. i i think the pork is the pig is the ultimate eating animal because um first of all you get a lot of meat for one life taken and that doesn't really factor in to the equation too often and of course it's hard to factor in how do you compare that with climate impact and you can't but i think it matters a lot but I think that pigs in this country and the way they're raised um, raises serious questions about animal welfare. And my vision of the food supply as you know, my food supply, lentils and well-raised pork. And I think that it's possible to raise pigs in a way that is. <laughs> that's that's going to be a really crappy dinner party. I know. I know. <laughs> <laughs> <We're>, <laughs> they're going to run us out of New York on a rail here. <laughs> um, uh, you haven't had my lentil soup. It's pretty damn good, oh, and it goodness. has lentils and well-raised pork. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, our, the motto in our house: we eat a lot of legumes, but we always say everything's better with preserved pork products. <laughs> so a little ham, a little sausage, a little bacon makes lentils delicious. But uh, I digress. So I think that it's possible to raise and slaughter pigs in a way that is humane. Um, and I think we can do it in a way that still keeps meat affordable. So for me, pigs are where the action is. You can often buy well-raised pork from places like Nyman Ranch or places that may be closer to home for you. Um, and so if you're looking for meat with less climate impact and Decent animal welfare standards. Well-raised pork is where it's at. Well, fake meat's better. Oh, yeah, you're right. <laughs> and that, I think, is, uh, you know, unfortunately, it has not caught on the way fake milk has. Um, you know, for all the hype over Beyond Meat and, uh, imp imp you know, Impossible Foods, there's still less than 1% of the meat market, um, which is really disappointing. I think Impossible is really pretty good because they use soy <laughs> to, uh, to uh, you know, foreshadow something we're going to talk about a little bit. Um, Beyond Meat, which still uses pea proteins, which is sort of notoriously you need to mask it um, because it has taste problems. Um, I think it's, it's not quite there yet. But, uh, and it's a real problem because you know, I really think ultimately there's going to have to be a lot of alternative protein consumption if we're going to solve these massive problems. Right now we're on track to deforest another two India's worth of land by 2050. And that essentially is game over for the Amazon, you know, game over for the climate. And um, so the math on plant-based meat versus actual meat is just as clear as the math on plant-based dairy versus actual dairy. Yeah. Um, and you know, there's a lot of jumping through hoops on these things where people say, um, well, we don't know what this really looks like at scale. We only have the numbers that the companies have released. Um, and those things are true. But the gap is so big that it's like, it's like 90 or 95 percent less uh, th yeah. the environmental footprint of these things. But it's problematic because, as Mike said, they, they're they not quite there on taste yet for a while. When Okay, let me ask. We need some audience participation here. How many of you went out to try a, like the, the even the, the Impossible Whopper or some plant-based Whopper someplace? Okay. Yeah, everybody, pretty much. All right, now, how many bought some and cooked it at home? Okay, we've got a bunch still. That's good. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> You're right. How many gave up their uh, the alternatives, right? It's like unfortunately meat is delicious and we've been, you know, our our ancestors have been have been eating it for 2 million years. And so they've really got to nail it and <laughs> it's just, a mature technology. Yeah, yeah exactly. That's what I'm always saying that uh, you know, it'll get better. Remember, remember alternative alternative dairy has been around now for, you know, for decades and it's, you know, it's doing okay. Um, 
Beyond Meat started in 2009, didn't have its first product until 2012. Impossible didn't have its first product till 2016. I mean, this stuff is brand new, but you know, Tesla came out and people immediately were like, okay, that's awesome. It's gotta get cheaper, but it's awesome. And, uh, and it kind of gave electric vehicles the kind of good name that I think it's gonna need to become really mainstream. I'm worried about uh, about alternative meats because you know you what you only get one chance to make a first impression, and I think it was okay. I I agree, and I think that there there's another problem with them that that has already manifested and is is going to continue to be a problem, and that is if you do the Venn diagram. I have a microphone, so I have to do it this way. If you do the Venn diagram between people who care about the climate impact of their food and people who are suspicious of highly processed food, you have almost complete overlap. <laughs> and so this food that is addressing specifically a climate problem is being viewed with suspicion by the very people it should appeal to. And I think that's been an issue for it f for a long time. Right. And so we shouldn't be right because we we did we did, <laughs> we did an a episode, whole episode we did an episode food. about processed food and the sort of you know the too long don't listen is like yeah there's a lot of crappy highly processed food yeah fake meat is highly processed but that's not really okay it doesn't mean that fake meat is bad and in fact fake meat is about as nutritious as the real meat all right so this is this is like the 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 15 second version all right maybe 30 second version <laughs> of what we did in the podcast so the thing about food processing is processed food at the root of obesity and disease i happen to think it is but that's because food manufacturers since the dawn of food processing have been using processing to sell you crap. And so all of the processed food that's out there has been processed to taste better, to be calorie dense, because that's what we like, to have salt and sugar and fat, because that's what sells food. So this, this food has been processed with the goal of selling you stuff that you will buy. And it's going to be cheap. It's going to be convenient. It's going to be specifically engineered to be overeaten. That's Doritos' reason for being. And and no, it's true. It's absolutely true. And and there are very few processed foods whose reason for being is righteous. And and in the case of fake meat. That is the case. If you talk to the people who are running these companies, and both Mike and I have been able to do that, they are true believers. They want to have a substitute so people eat less meat because they're trying to save the planet. So when you look at processed food, and, and is it icky, and do you want to eat it because it's highly processed, you have to think about why it was formulated in the first place. There's no reason to think that the ingredients in processed meat are bad for you. Yeah, it's, I mean, one of the I. This is something we argue about. I don't think really the motives matter that much, but the product is just not. You know, it has most of the fake burgers have a little bit more sodium, but they have no cholesterol. They're basically they seem to be pretty much a wash. Um, you know, because they're, you know, they're they're soy or they're they're peas, and that kind of uh, that kind of leads to uh, the other three parts of the of my plate, right? Because right, right. <laughs> because um, one, you know. So, so much of the climate problem is, is meat and dairy. Um, it just really is. And we're not going to talk about cows anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Lisa, I'm not. I can't promise for Mike. Yeah, exactly. Why, why, why would you pin me down like that? <laughs> Sorry, friend. <laughs> so the rest of the plate is plants. And... This is the thing that I think is good about my plate, and you can talk about the things that are bad about my plate. But the thing that's good about my plate, it's that it's trying to be some graphic representative of like what your plate should look like, and most of it is plants, and I think that's reasonable. But all plants are not created equal. And so we have three categories. We have vegetables, we have grains, and we have fruits. And they're, they're all fine, but vegetables are less fine. And I know this is like, 
Don't it's get her amazing. started on salad. <laughs> <laughs> it's astonishing that I have any friends at all. Um, so vegetables are a luxury food, and their climate impact is higher than any of the other. I, I see your face. <laughs> <laughs> and their climate impact is higher than that of any other uh, plant food. But in some ways, it doesn't really matter, because just like we're, the people are a rounding er error on, the, on, the, on the, the land use of the earth, vegetables are a rounding error in our food system and its climate impact. We have in the United States 400 million acres of crops. And the percent devoted to vegetables is, shout it out if you know it, that's my husband. He knows. <laughs> I actually have a husband. <laughs> it is 1%. And so, and, and this kind of blows people's minds because we've sort of, we've been given this vision of the kind of agriculture that's better. Like the corn and soy, that's the bad agriculture. And the small farm that's growing uh, rotations of vegetables, preferably locally, that's the good agriculture. It's totally not. Vegetables are some of the most resource intensive crops we grow. They have much higher pesticide and fertilizer loads than any of the other plants that we're going to be talking about, except for pesticides on fruits also. Um, and they are, they're, they're expensive, not because they haven't been subsidized, but because growing them is inherently expensive. And if you don't believe me, not that anyone would not believe me, if you don't believe me, go check out some of like the UC Davis case studies of raising, uh, what it takes to raise broccoli, for example. And if you look at those things, the costs involved in raising broccoli are, it's about five, $7,000 an acre. For corn, it's about one-tenth of that. Those crops are so much less expensive than, than vegetables. So where do, where, where do vegetables fit in your diet? It's fine to eat vegetables. Believe me, if there's some room for cheese, there's totally room for kohlrabi. <laughs> and it's, a, it, but, but the focus of a plant-based diet, the focus of a climate-friendly diet, isn't vegetables. It's those other two, grains and fruits. Right, and, and I think, and essentially, again, efficiency is the king on this stuff. And you know, when you'd <laughs> say that word, and everybody thinks, oh, is Monsanto paying you? <laughs> because, because like the world has sort of divided into two visions of agriculture. And one of them is like this big industrial bad agriculture, and one is this natural, climate-friendly, good agriculture, and efficiency is associated with the bad stuff. Right, it's like fertilizers, chemical fertilizers, and pesticides. Especially Ew, when you say it like that. But remember, it's like, you know, fertilizers, they're absolute problems. There are climate impacts. They're usually made from natural gas. They're fossil fuel. They help stuff grow. <laughs> Pesticides, again, very intense industrial process. They kill pests. <laughs> and, and again, what we keep, I keep banging my spoon on my high chair about is that we are going to need a lot more food with a lot less land. And when you talk about these, you know, lovely organic farms with the red barns and where, you know, all the animals have names instead of numbers, it's very nice, but it, it takes more land. Um, I don't hate those farms as much as Mike does. Well, again, I don't, I don't hate them. I hate, oh, yes, you know, you I, do. well, I hate what they do to the climate. I hate what they're going to do to people who live in the floodplain in Bangladesh. Um, you know, there's this sense that, like, oh, if you care about the climate, it's this kind of sort of twee, you know, environmentalist thing, um, as opposed to thinking about food that people eat and, uh, you know, about prices and, you know, kitchen table issues. But, you know, climate hurts people. And, uh, and soy, the reason that we grow so much of it is because it's like 
the most efficient vegetable oil. It's like it's a, the most efficient yeah, plant so protein. Exactly, and uh, and the reason we the reason we grow so much so much corn. It's like it's awesome. It's an incredible starch. Can, can like, I can I do calories per acre? Is that too much? Uh, yeah, go for it. Go for it. It's like we can't we can't just stipulate that they're the best. Right. So so there's a metric I I have a one woman crusade to try and make everyone care about, and that's calories per acre, because we all need about a million calories, give or take, every year, and we only have about a third of an acre of cropland globally per person. So you got to grow a lot of food. And other things matter. Protein matters, nutrients matter, but calories really matter. We have to feed people. And, and so corn, I mean, everybody hates corn because it's been vilified from here to Sunday, but that's because we eat it in like soda. If we ate it in tortillas, it would be fine. And it's 15 million calories per acre, which is huge. The only thing that's up there with that is uh, potatoes. potatoes. Interestingly. Potatoes are also awesome, by the way. Oh, potato fan over there in the corner. Interestingly, beef, which provides <laughs> yeah. 3% of our calories. <laughs> and uses what percent of our land? Like 50, so, 60%. <laughs> so the Not crops good. that we've been taught to hate, corn and soy, um, in, they earn our hatred not from anything inherent about them, but because of how they're used. And so if we're all in on tofu and edamame and polenta and tortillas, that's going to be sort of the ultimate climate diet with a side of vegetables and maybe a little bit of well-raised pork, and now you're talking. And and so um, we should also remember that that's like in the United States, like 90 percent of our corn goes either into our fuel tanks, which don't get me right. started, or it goes into our, you know, high fructose corn syrup or, our, you know, all the other nasty stuff. Um, while in the developing world, you know, people eat their grains. I mean, that's right. uh, and, and that's an important source of nutrition. And that's something where, again, not to, uh, you know, be a bore about this, but you know, if if they happen. had, <laughs> yeah, that happens all the time. But if uh, but if they had in in the developing world, if they had more fertilizer, if they had more pesticides, if they had better seeds, um, they could grow more of it, and they would deal with a lot of those hunger problems that you have out there, as well as climate problems. Because remember, that's you know that's why they're cutting down trees. So grow more food. Grains and legumes, they're called row crops because they are planted and harvested in rows by machines, no backbreaking labor, are a completely different animal from, uh, from vegetables. <laughs> Wait, strike that metaphor. Um, they're a completely different crop group from vegetables. And the USDA calls them different things. Vegetables are called specialty crops for a reason. So the backbone of a diet that's healthy for humans and for planet is right there in the row crop range. It's whole grains and legumes and fruits. <laughs> yeah, we like fruits. We like fruits. <laughs> exactly. They're, they're good for you. And also, they're delicious. They and they grow on trees. Trees. We like trees. We like trees. Yeah. Uh, we, we, you know, dumped all over the idea of, you know, storing carbon in the soil because it's really hard to measure and and uh, and some of us are skeptical that you can actually get a lot more carbon into the soil. But when you plant a tree, there's a lot of carbon. And you can see it because there's like a tree. And trees are also perennial, so you don't have to plow up the land. They're a permaculture product. And also many calories per acre on both uh, fruits and tree nuts. So fruits and tree nuts are an excellent part of a climate friendly diet and just partly, to prove partly because they're super dense they are high yield and why is that we're sitting here in new york city to bring it back to to where we yes. started yes. right like in new york city it's very dense with people they go up in skyscrapers so they don't have to spread as far out into the into the exurbs because you have eight ten million people you know on, on a little island um it's the same with agricultural sprawl if you have very high density and, and with a tree, you can use that air above you to grow lots of stuff up there. Um, you can grow more there, and you don't need to sprawl out into the Amazon. Um, and just to prove that we're not blowing smoke, we actually have some data. And uh, the data source that we tend to rely on um, for 
our investigation is a source called Our World in Data. And it's, it's online. You can look it up. It has data you can slice and dice every which way. And I saw the chart, so I do, do know it exists. Do we have the next, the next <laughs> slide? There it there is. There we go. And so there you can see. Ooh, what's that at the top? What, oh, that looks like beef. Oh, good, good. <laughs> and so these are the actual numbers of uh, what the climate impact is per 1,000 calories of the food. And you can see that beef tops the charts by a long shot. Chicken and pork are hanging out there at 10% of beef. And you can see that vegetables, like um, there aren't that many vegetables in the database, but brassicas, for example, have a much higher climate impact than apples. And, and, and my favorite, legumes, lentils, are way down at the bottom with tree nuts. So if you're going to build a climate-friendly diet, focus on the things on the bottom, use the things on the top sparingly, and Bob's your uncle. Right, <laughs> exactly. And, and remember, I mean, Beef is so bad that cutting out beef and la wasting less food gets you a lot of the way there. I mean, if you want to go vegan, that's phenomenal. That's um, awesome. That's the best. Uh, neither one of us are vegans, nope. um, but that, that's great. If you're a, but if you're, a, if you're a vegetarian, also great, but if you just cut out beef, like I have, and that's generally just as good as being a vegetarian because, as we discussed, the, the beef is such a problem. Um, and if you go vegetarian, you usually end up eating more, more, more dairy. God knows I would with all, all that pizza. <laughs> so, so that's our rundown, and we would love to take questions. Is there a microphone circulating? Um, it's a small group. I'm sure we could hear you anyway. Uh, Nicholas has a microphone. Okay, we've got some questions over here. Two questions. Oh, thank you. Hi. This was a really, really wonderful chat. Um, thank you. I learned a lot. I'm Molly from Princeton University, and uh, you haven't mentioned fish at all. Um, we have not mentioned fish. And I'm just wondering about some insights there and seafood. Um, and then the other thing that I wanted to bring up was, I think it's great that you have this measure where you're looking at uh, CO2 equivalents, but, and you talked about animal welfare as well, mm -hmm. but um, it seems like maybe there's some other considerations, maybe in terms of biodiversity or overfishing or Always. things like that, yep. um, and just like how you think about what you want your metric to be. Well, your second question in some ways answers the first one, because one of the reasons we don't talk about seafood so much, and we do talk about seafood, especially yeah. where we talk about uh, aquaculture, Full disclosure, well, I'm a gentleman oyster farmer at this point, but I, my husband and I have run an oyster farm for 12 years. Um, but fish depends entirely on the fishery. And you know, usually the carbon impact is in the same ballpark as uh, chicken and, and pork, but it depends on the fishery. And for me, overfishing is a really big problem. It's a big deal, and so um, so I look at that metric first, not the the uh, climate impact. But fish farming is a really exciting um, mm -hmm. way to make a lot of food with you know generally better on land. So using a little land, the the ones that are the sort of the net pens in the ocean have all kinds of environmental problems, use all kinds of pesticides and antibiotics and gross stuff. Um, but you're starting to see some very cool technologies. I've written about uh, the Atlantic Sapphire Company, which is these Norwegian dudes who kind of look like Vikings and talk like tech bros. And they're, uh, they're building the world's largest fish farm back in my, in my neck of the woods uh, at the edge of the Everglades. Um, and they are going to grow essentially half of the U.S. salmon diet on an 80-acre, now I guess they've expanded, so it'll be a 160-acre tomato farm. Um, so there's just, it's, it's difficult, it's new technology. Some people complain about the, you know, that the fish aren't getting to live their natural, natural life, um, but it's, it's organic, it's pesticide free, it's antibiotic free, it's microplastic free. I thought you made free. fun of organic well, pesticide free Well, if you guys put it in a tank, I got no All problem right, then with, you're it, okay right? with it, right? then you right? You only and, have a problem with it out in and, the world. And because fish are in many ways, right, you, you don't, they don't need as much energy, they don't require as much feed to make a, a you know, a calorie of filet, partly it, because, you know, they're 
<laughs> they're in the water, so they're cold. They're cold-blooded. They're you know they're they're swimming around. It's basically it's a very they're they're very efficient, and uh, and so yeah. So if we can make a lot of them um, without a lot of land, and particularly without you know without feeding them a lot of fish, um, which has been a big problem with the aquaculture industry, mm -hmm. but they're they're coming up with uh, with alternatives. That's I think a really promising source of protein. And your 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 second question also. Um, we oh, yeah. say it on the on the show all the time. Right, food is all trade offs all the time. There's no one metric that's going to tell you the thing that's best, um, <laughs> and it's really hard to balance those things out. So the climate impact isn't the only thing; it's just the thing we came here to but talk about. But guess what's the worst for biodiversity? <laughs> yes, <laughs> cows. <laughs> Who knew? <laughs> Yeah, and worse for nutrient pollution. So, you know, not we, everything's all trade-offs. We promise no, oh, I promise no more cows. It is delicious. Um, <laughs> any, any other questions? There was another hand over here. There's a hand over there, hand over here. Hi, uh, my name is Alex. I have two questions. Uh, I so I just want to clarify, you said bacon's good for the environment, right? Is that, <laughs> is that what you said? And second question was, so what about these, like, future technologies such as, like, lab-grown meat and, like, vertical farming? Is that a reasonable oh. solution, or is that kind of like nuclear fusion, where it's oh, always 50 those years are away? Two, two very different, different things. <laughs> <laughs> yay, yay lab-grown meat, boo, boo vertical, vertical, vertical farming. farming. Um, again, lab-grown meat isn't quite there yet. Um, you know, you're starting to, in Singapore. They've, you've, you know, you can get a couple. Of, and I've, I've eaten a, a lab-grown chicken nugget. Tasted like chicken. Um, at the time, it cost ninety dollars for that nugget. Uh, we're now down probably to sig single digits, um, but it's still that's going to be a while before it's uh, you know mass mar mass market. But it's a very promising technology. Uh, vertical. Sorry. Uh, you know, oh, that's it's, anybody's right? guess. It's one of the, I don't think it's one of those things that's five years away and always will be. Hey, um, I kind of do. No, I th and you're already going to see. Um, there, th like I talked to a company the other day that's making uh, lab-grown fats. And by the way, we shouldn't call it lab-grown because they're not. They're going to be in bio basically like they're brewing meat, and they're just going to brew the fats and put them in uh, in plant in plant-based burgers. So we'll call them and, that grown meat. Yeah, exactly. And that and that's I think better. I think that's going to be there. You know, that'll be cost competitive in a few years. Um, vertical farms, on the other hand, we did a whole, a, a cool episode about it. Yeah, yeah, we did. And so here's the thing about vertical farms, and it was it was interesting. We had friends over for dinner, and and. The, our friend who's a musician, he doesn't traffic in food that much, he says like, well, vertical farms, those will solve the problem. All right, here's, there's two problems with vertical farms. The first is, ra oh, sorry, thank you. Vertical farm are, are hydroponic farms that grow in buildings where you can stack them up, so you can, you can you grow much more uh, food, much more Vegetable. The idea is like you're getting rid of the sprawl, land. right? You're getting, right. Yeah. You can, so we're just going to grow vertical instead of horizontal. But the huge problem with them is that when you have lettuce out in the field, uh, it's turning solar energy into food. When you have lettuce in the vertical farm, it's turning grid energy into food. And if you have a one-acre greenhouse, a one-acre vertical farm with ten layers, if you're going to power that with solar energy, you need like 50 acres of solar to do it. Plants take a lot of energy. But the other problem is they're raising fruit fruit vegetables like, you right. know, baby arugula. And if nobody had any baby arugula from now until the end of time, everything would be fine. <laughs> but if there's no bread, there's blood in the streets. And, in, in fairness, and, they're pretty good at making weed. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah they are. Yeah. Actually, yeah. <laughs> high margin crop. Uh, it, you know, right. Like so a... you, need, you need high margin crops <laughs> to make that work. But, uh, you know, somebody tried to grow wheat in one of these things, and it, it, it ended up using like $15 million worth of electricity. Yeah. And it, it was nuts. I mean, again, we're, since we're really thinking all the time about how to feed the world without frying the world, um, you know, these sort of lettuce solutions are great. And if you can get rid of Visalia, you know, or let them grow something more productive in Visalia and Yuma, Arizona, that'll be great. But you're not solving the world's food problem. And, you know, with, I uh, grow oysters. Lettuce. I'm in favor of luxury products for rich people. But <laughs> that's what these are. Yeah, yeah. 
too much energy, really. Uh, great, great talk. Uh, much better than the last people. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you guys, you guys were, you guys were amazing. So, thank so, you. So uh, I was fishing for compliments. Thank so, you. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so and look, at half the place left after you finished. <laughs> exactly. I, exactly. <laughs> Uh, they exactly. were just tired. Um, t tomatoes, please explain. Why can I not eat tomatoes, tomatoes. anymore? And uh, you can, can I grow tomatoes. tomatoes in my backyard? No. Oh, oh, that's a great point. Also addressed in my book, To Boldly Grow. About firsthand <laughs> food. If you grow them in your yard, it's probably a pretty good bargain because uh, they're, it's lots of the costs. If you're growing them from seed and you're not using a lot of amendments and things like that, you'll probably do better. Mm -hmm. Tomatoes are an issue. Um, a lot of them are grown in hothouses. Um, and actually, you know, I, I don't actually know why tomatoes are so much worse from some of the other, than some of the other things. And I'm going to get back to you on that one. Right. But some of those green... Some of those greenhouses where they where they use the sun, those are um, good. Those, right, those they're not be, bad. Those can be really helpful, but again, it it doesn't seem like it's going to work for the crops that feed the world. I'm gonna have, well, maybe we should do an episode on tomatoes. Yeah. There's well, a, I love tomatoes. We totally get that. Right, that's but, but, true. But remember, but. yeah. Exactly. <laughs> no, 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 no. But this is partly we always like all of this stuff is fungible, right? And this right. is the same. The same is true with trees. The same is true with meat. Um, it's like it's like yeah. If you, it's better if you could power it with you know by using a big solar array. That's great. But then you should actually just use that solar array to power the grid and you know and right. and grow your grow your lettuce in Visalia. But. So, but the thing is, if you have a green source of power in the grid, um, I think you want to use it for things that don't have green alternatives. And food has a green alternative. Transportation doesn't. Right. The sun Heating your home doesn't. And we're talking about a lot of power. Yeah. This is one of the reasons. But no, I agree. When we have when we have a, 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 a grid that's completely powered from renewables and, and carbon-free sources, um, and it's cheap and it's abundant, the math changes. I totally agree with you on that. Yeah. Let's take one more question. Okay. okay. We, we can stay all night. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, hey there, I'm Seth. Um, so first, big fan of uh, baby arugula, so I'll fight you on that <laughs> later. Uh, but I'm also a big fan of Chapelin tacos. So you haven't talked about insect protein. Is that, huh? is that an answer? <laughs> All right, there, there aren't very many hills that I'll die on, but the fact that Americans People won't like eat die insects. like die on a million hills. <laughs> 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 Sorry. Busted. <laughs> I, I do not think Americans will eat insects. And it will always be a small niche. And, and one of the great things about the plant-based meats is that it means you don't have to eat mealworms. And I, I, th I think that there are places where insects, where we don't, where, because the reason we won't eat insects isn't because of anything about the insect. It's a learned disgust response. But just because it's a learned response doesn't mean it's not real. So if we want insects to be part of the solution, first of all, you've got to do it in places where people don't have that response. And second, we have to raise a generation of kids here that doesn't have that response. So if you think insects are icky, just feed them to your kids. <laughs> well, and, and also, I mean, I do think we're going to hopefully feed a lot of insects to our, you know, our right. farm animals and our, you know, our farmed fish and, uh, and our pets who don't have that same kind of uh, learned response. Yeah, they eat vomit. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> do we have other questions? We have time still, don't we? Uh, <laughs> oh, come on. <laughs> this is fun. 
Um, so I'm an energy nerd, but I also like food. Okay, good. Um, but when I think about like the renewable energy, the de- decarbonized ideal for like net zero 2050, we know what that looks like. The technology is like not quite there, but like we kind of know how to get there. It all makes sense. You can build something and get a contract for it. That makes a lot of sense. I'm an investor. We like contracts. It like works. Whereas like I'm a vegan-ish and I generally care about what I eat and health and whatever, but I just can't expect everybody else to do that. So like, what is the actual vision or like what's the this sort of is, goal? Oh, this is such a perfect question because it's like the reason our podcast exists. <laughs> Because uh, again, no, we I know, both I know it. somebody, you go, you I know go, somebody go, who's go. writing a book about this. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, the thing about energy, and I, I came from writing about energy and climate, um, and uh, and the thing about like as everybody in this room and the people who left all know, <laughs> um, uh, like like decarbonizing the the energy is going to be really hard, but we basically know what to do, right? We just gotta, you know, you gotta ship to clean energy and then electrify everything. And it's gonna be, like, it's gonna take a lot of political will, um, but, but we know how to do it. Um, to me, the interesting thing about, about food is that, like, we don't know anything. We, we don't no even, clue. like, we're just learning what questions to ask, um, which is kind of, to us, it's sort of, I think, what makes it so exciting. Um, you know, one of the things we argue, I mean, one of the things we know is that, for example, there are certain foods that we know are bad, <laughs> and we can see what particular alternatives would be. And gee, wouldn't it be great if the government that has, you know, a spent, you know, governments around the world spend five hundred billion dollars every year on farm subsidies, and b have spent in the past, you know, hundreds of billions of dollars on subsidizing renewable energy? Wouldn't it be nice if they threw at least a little bit of money towards some of these alternative proteins that we know can have such an unbelievable impact on reducing demand for the stuff that is, you know, destroying the climate, even and, if we completely decarbonize the energy system? And Mike and I don't agree 100% on that because I'm not sure that government investment is going to make that happen. But I think at the root of your question, is also an important distinction between energy and food. And that is that energy is often, or I would say in places, certainly in places like New York, and correct me if I get this wrong, because energy is not my sphere, um, is is something that has a lot of um, institutional and state involvement. Whereas food is the sum of individuals' choices. And yet yeah, there are institutions and they can do things. But I think when we talk about this, this, this tension between individual action and in institutional action, in energy, the, it tips way over in, into institutional because the, you know, the state has control of the power grid. But in food, I think it tips way over into individual action because people will only grow and sell the things that people will buy and eat. Yeah, I mean, th- this is an area where we disagree, because I just think, <laughs> I, I mean, again, I think that's where just as the government, you know, what is what we will drive, wh- what we will drive has changed because something awesome that's green came along. And I think, uh, and the government had a lot to do with that. And I think the government can help a lot on the, con- on the demand side, but also on the supply side. You can take some of those $500 billion a year that government spend basically just to make rich farmers richer and poor farmers richer, in fairness. Um, or poor farmers poorer sometimes. Yeah, sometimes. Um, but you know, you can use that money, if not, like right now, not even just to uh, promote things that we know will help the climate, because right now we don't even know. We need to find out. We need to be you know, funding all kinds of demonstration projects and pilot projects like we did with energy you know, I, my last book was about the Obama stimulus, which basically threw money against the energy wall uh, to, to see what would stick. And, you know, basically what stuck was solar and wind and LEDs and energy efficiency and, you know, electric vehicle batteries. But we haven't done that yet with farming. We've just thrown money at farmers and said, farm. So. And I, uh, can we keep going? Or we burned through our hour. I don't want to overstay yeah, our yeah, welcome yeah. here. <laughs> We're getting the, the Metza Metza sign here. Yeah. 
Um, one more. You had people, your hand up earlier. People, oh man, people, people are like, are like sticking their eyes. Hi, thank you for your <laughs> insights. Really appreciate a lot that's been shared. I had a question. I'm curious on your thoughts about the intersection of climate impacts and the environmental justice impacts of certain mm -hmm. foods, particularly when you were speaking about pork, just thinking about mm -hmm. the localized environmental impacts of industrial farming. Mm -hmm. It's particularly, as you were mentioning, it's more efficient, but a lot of times there's more harmful mm -hmm. emissions and pollutants affecting primarily low income black and brown communities. Um, so what are your thoughts on that? And also the intersection with, uh, you know, farm workers' rights, particularly mm -hmm. in industrial animal uh, agriculture and in, uh, you know, crops as well, because I just, uh, as, I guess as an energy nerd and a longtime vegan <laughs> too, I just think a lot as well about the, the ethical as well as climate impacts and how that's intersecting with uh, workers' rights, immig immigrant rights, and just across the, the supply chain. Thank you so much. I, I, I like to let, like, I like to let Mike handle the easy ones. <laughs> no, no. So vegan and energy nerd, you're probably as popular as we are. <laughs> and it's a great question. And, and it goes back to, to, it's Molly, right? Molly's question um, about how there are all of these things that happen. And sometimes they're interrelated, but sometimes they're not. And so... Uh, you know, we're trying to focus on this one thing that we're trying to understand. And, you know, we haven't talked about overfishing. We haven't talked about farm workers. Um, we haven't talked about justice. And all of those things matter. But in a lot of ways, they're not related to the climate impact. They intersect. But there's, and you're right that, you know, for example, the, the, uh, the pollution from the animal facilities are affecting rural poor, mostly poor rural communities in, in states where, where those are an issue. And farm workers, has, this, is, this has been a real battle. And th this actually goes back to one of the problems about vegetables, because if we're going to, to give farm workers a living wage, um, it means that those products that are that are priced out that some people are priced out of already are going to be more expensive. So yeah, there's absolutely an intersection, and it's always a trade-off. And what I want us to be able to do is work toward all of those goals. And sometimes they intersect, and sometimes they don't. And I know that's a very unsatisfactory answer, um, but. I have found in writing about food for as long as I have that for me to understand the whole picture, I sort of have to understand one thing at a time. And then slowly the whole picture builds. But just because we're talking about climate doesn't mean it's the only issue on the table. And, and I would say that sometimes there isn't a trade off, right? I mean, uh, you know, first of all, like in the larger picture, like, Fixing, fixing the climate. We all, we all know who's going to be the most affected by, by climate change, and it's not, you know, it's not the yes. rich people in their McMansions. Um, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's disproportionately going to be vulnerable communities. Um, and we, we sort of just got to policy at the end. But I think your, your point about the industrial farms, uh, the, the feedlots, is a, is a really good one. Um, but that's where. I look again at this que this point of you know there's got to be a deal you know on on uh, you know when we look at this from a poly pers perspective for years it's just been you know the ag guys have a lot of power so we're, we're going to throw them a lot of money and they can do whatever they want and hopefully at some point you know if that's just going to be the way it is then we're all screwed um, there's nothing to do about it but the can, we can see that there's an efficiency upside. To, uh, to certain, some of these farming practices that uh, could have a justice downside, and there's a deal there. It's like, hey, how can we help you with your efficiency, but you've got a responsibility too. Um, so, you know, we want to increase, pre we want to improve your yields, we want you to, you know, make more food and that will make you more money, but you've got to do something, you know, about your methane, but also, about the rivers in North Carolina, and also the, peop the, you know, the people in black and brown communities who live by those rivers in North Carolina. And that's the sort of, you know, 
maybe this is the wrong, <laughs> wrong context to say it, but there's such an obvious deal to be had that that's one of the reasons, you know, there are a million reasons to be pessimistic about this stuff because like, you know, we're 25 years behind energy and we've barely started and a lot of the ideas out there are bad. <laughs> um, but the good news is that there's, you know, these deals are so obvious and so just waiting to be cut um, that you know, I'm kind of hopeful that people are going to have common sense and come to the table and say, like, okay, you know, how can we do something that's that's going to be, you know, eliminate some of these trade-offs and some of these problems? It's okay. a hard one. It's a very hard one. Yeah. I, right. let's, uh, let's, let's wait, let I think we have jail. to let people go. <laughs> you are excused. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.